Oh, timing is everything. They are making the announcement here for the final day of Cisco Live 2024 in Amsterdam. Welcome back to the live stream, everyone. I'm so glad to have you back here with us today. My name is Steve Moulter, and I have my dear friend Nish Parker on set with Hi, me. Hi, Steve. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. You look spectacular. You look <laughs> uh, fresh and vibrant and ready for a final day of incredible content and great talks and great executive interviews and uh, I, I party. Everything else, that's enough, all right, there's so much to You're do. already set for the party tonight is what's going on. Yes. I, I, I just put two and two <laughs> together. I forgot, we've got so much good content coming at you over the next, what is it, seven hours or so here, and then tonight is the customer appreciation event taking place over in the keynote space that I know everybody is so excited about last year. Uh, for the party following this event. It was so loud, I, I genuinely could not hear myself think. <laughs> you were having a fabulous yes, time. Yes, it was amazing last year. And I'm sure it's going to be great this year as well. Every time we do this, Steve, the time goes so quickly. We start out on day one, and then we're already out closing the day, like so the last day of the show. It happens super fast, but that's because we're so busy, there's so much to do. The amount of guests that we get to meet here in the studio and then take through to our viewers, um, I'm so glad that we can play a role in that and help people understand how exciting it is to be here in Amsterdam at Cisco Live. If you haven't been to a Cisco Live before, or if you have and you're missing it this year, be sure to get back here next time. It really is so true. Another thing that I think is a great indicator of how much we've accomplished in the past few days and as quickly as it's gone by, I look into the schedule and I see how many things that we've already recorded. So we've got a whole bunch of great interviews coming up today. We want to make sure that you hear in on every single one of them. If you missed any content, by the way, from the past few days, don't worry, it is all waiting for you at CiscoLive.com. So much more coming up, but I look at what we've already captured, I look at the amount of videos that have already been posted, and I think that is a massive quantity of value that we've already created for everybody who is actually here at the show with us at the Rye in Amsterdam, and for all of you who are tuning in on the broadcast as well. I, I think it's just a it's a great service, but it's also a great joy to be a part of, Nish, as you said. Absolutely, I mean, Steve, I'm curious, has, has there been a highlight for you so far? I know we're going into day three. <clears throat> I'm going to sound like a broken record here because I've already <laughs> thrown so many accolades his way. I really did love talking with Gene Hall. Right. Gene is just one of those great visionaries because he talks about where we are right now in very practical and concrete terms. He knows the portfolio incredibly well. He knows where the value lies for our customers. He's very people-focused, which you know is my yes. thing, but he's also a really good future visionary and he's a great corporate storyteller for Cisco. And because corporate storytelling is kind of my thing, I just find a lot of value in him, and I just frankly like having him around. I know, cool he's awesome. Dude, right, how about for you? Oh, that's a tricky one. I mean, yesterday I spent a lot, a lot of time on our other set, seated with guests. I think it's my favorite place to be at Cisco <laughs> Live. Not only because we get to sit down, we're on our feet so much, and you know, um, but I love having the opportunity to sit down for a slightly longer period of time and really deep dive into what those guests are working on. So I sat down with Emma Carpenter yesterday, who's our Chief Revenue Officer for our Amazing. security business. Really great to hear the announcements and really kind of dig into what was mentioned in the keynote around the identity announcements. So great to hear from her. Um, and of course, I, you know, right where you're standing, I was there yesterday, and. I, um, Oliver was over here, Oliver Tusik, our EMEA president. I got to sit down with, well, stand up with him yesterday. Stand up with him. <laughs> His energy is always great, right? Whether it's, you know, on the keynotes or here in the studio, got my selfie with Oliver. You have to get your selfies at Cisco Live. It's a, a great way to show everybody else, you know, how much fun you're having and make it, them a little bit jealous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I forgot, I got the chance to talk with Javed Khan, and it's very yes. hard to actually get Javed because he's in constant demand. And the other thing is, I had a short segment with Snora Kesbu, and Snora is another one of those people who just is a very enriching person. He's charming and he's and he's very well spoken and he's energized about everything that we're doing. And whenever I hear our executives speaking from a point of passion, that's what always gets me excited. We can talk product, technology, solutions, services, capabilities all day long. Cisco's a, re a remarkably powerful company. It's when you get to be up close and personal with the passion behind the people leading the charge. Yes. That's what gets me excited and that's what we get really excited about bringing to all of you as well. Should we introduce our other two hosts here we on the broadcast? To, Steve, can we not just keep chatting? But they're so, <laughs> they're so lovely. They're they wonderful are. human beings. And Let's it looks like, oh them. good, I'm looking in the monitor. <laughs> There's my friend, Cedric Devalder. Hello, Cedric. Hey, Steve and Nish, thanks for coming to actually then I still have a job, to be honest, on this last day here at Cisco Live. Uh, but no, it's really great. As you said, we just opened the world of solutions. People are coming in um, and it's the last day, but that doesn't mean that there is stuff to learn, stuff to explore and so on. And I see Rob behind me who is actually racing a car and actually bumping into something. So let's just go and explore what Rob is doing. I think it has something to do with our McLaren uh, partnership, but let's just ask him what he's up to. Rob? 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 Rob, what's this about? 
cars uh, on a track with cameras, and um, no, it's about a McLaren racing partnership. They've got some very interesting cars here using uh, just a combination of not only just remote control racing, it is fun, but the augmented reality part of it just takes it to a whole new level. When you look down through the controller, here, let me show you. When I'm back here, yeah. the controller here, I can drive. Let's see, let me back up. Where'd my car go? Oh, he's over there. Up, back up, and then I go forward. But see, it's a whole different view here, and I can see where to get points. But it's actually quite fascinating when you're down here, and here it comes by us. Oh, but I get... <laughs> I'm not that great at it, but I'm getting better until I was interrupted. <clears throat> But uh, yeah, see, so I don't know. I think this is really just a fun thing. I think my takeaway from this is that I, I want this at home. I don't know how much that helps Cisco, but it is quite fun. I think you're here for the conference. So if, at you're good, I'm gonna, if you're good, I'm going to finish. Yeah, sure, you do whatever you want. I just know that I'm not going to step into a car with you. Um, if you want to have the opportunity to win one of those, you can come here um, at the circuit challenge in the hub and they have an then you will have an opportunity to basically um, win one. I'm just going to keep walking a little bit while our cameraman is still following Rob. Um, but there is just so much more to explore, I think. As I said, it, it's the last day, but there is, there is much to learn. There is so much going on still. Uh, and I think our friends of DevNet actually have loads of uh, hands-on labs. They have inspiring talks. They have thought leadership sessions as well. Um, so I see people like <laughs> running away from me. Uh, but basically, there is so much going on. There is also the Network Automation Labs at DevNet, um, who are in part or which is in partnership with Red Hat. So we can have a look here. And then what else have we got? We have people. We have customer success stories. I know that's one of Nish's favorites, and it's always a packed theater. Uh, we have Cisco Insider behind us still. Um, be sure to visit that wall. Of course, there's food. Um, and I have my buddy here. Let's ask him what he's most excited about. What are you most excited about? Yeah, I agree. And oh, he wants a selfie as well. So let's take a selfie. You know, you can't come to Cisco Life without a selfie. And I'll post it on our social media channels using hashtag Cisco Life E M E A. And with that, we're gonna go back. Over Oh, let's have a look. Yeah, just before we go back, there is a car here, and I think it's Rob. You know, it's just too much fun. So I'll just stop the fun. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Ah. Uh, anyway, let's go back to the studio right now. Oh, nobody stops the fun like you do, Cedric. That's what I always say. Uh, bravo. Thank you, Rob, for showing us your, uh, your driving skills. Now I know next time I come to Dallas, I'm not getting in a car with you. Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a moment to talk about the human-to-human -human connection because that is such a huge part of what it is that really Cisco is all about at our core. We talk technology constantly, and we're so darn good at it that it's easy to do. And it's wonderful to have conversations around AI, Gen AI capabilities and so forth while we're here at the show. But ultimately, this is a people first experience. Everybody who's here is here to have a great time with one another, to create social setups, to create connections, to find those points of intersection where we can create and innovate together. Cedric had an opportunity to walk around earlier here in the show and find a few new friends and ask what their experiences have been like. Let's check that out. I don't like having to pick just one tech trend because I'd say in all for me it's AI but specifically it's around large language models and the brainstorming and the different things that that's opened up for my workflows but I'm curious what has it done for you let's find out what do you think's worth paying attention to I like, oh, I like the IoT dashboards and the environment sensors, getting people back to the office. No more of this staying at home trying to, <laughs> trying to pretend you can really work there, right? We want to see people in and it's uh, encouraging people that in a nice place to work is important. Right, because we need to build networks at those offices where the people are. Yeah, come and make connections. Private 5G. Private 5G, why is that? A good possibility and a new chance for, especially for automotive companies where we are dealing with. So uh, smart manufacturing and all these stuff, topics. So it's quite interesting and the, the market is progressing well. I think everyone is really interested in smart buildings and, and it gives you a really good idea of like all of the technology that Cisco are using for smart buildings. I think AI to make networking even easier.
Hey, fantastic job, Rob, by apologies. I introduced that as a Cedric Vox Pop segment. No, that was a Rob Boyd Vox Pop. He's everywhere. I never know where Rob is going to be or who he's going to talk to. We are going to change gears here at this point. We're going to kick off the day with something that I think is maybe one of our most important initiatives here, and that is EDI, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion. Every single organization today has got an initiative for inclusion and diversity, but it is so essential for what we do here at Cisco. It fuels the power of the connection that we create. So what do we mean when we say inclusion? It's smart business. It's not about checking a box here, right? This is about making our organizations as strong as they can possibly be. It's about igniting fresh ideas. It's about sparking creativity from multiple viewpoints and perspectives. So how do we get there? Well, here at Cisco, we get there by closing the gender pay gap. We get there by focusing on social justice. Inclusion is about accelerating talent diversity. It's about extended and expanded partner development opportunities. It's about supplier diversity. Where do we get what we need to build what we build? The more diverse, the better. The more diverse, the stronger we are as a company. It's about CSR. So right now, we are going to head it across to the other side of our studio, where Nish Parker has got a couple of special guests with us. Hello, guest. I get to see you up there in the camera, but <laughs> Nish, let's go ahead and send it your way. Thanks so much, Steve. Now, as you said, this is a really imp important topic here at the show, and especially because Cisco's purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. So I'm joined by Kim Pash. Kim, you are the VP of Virtual Sales here in EMEA, and Phil Wolfenden, you are the VP of CX Centers here in EMEA. So welcome. How are you both doing? Great, thank you for having us today. Of course, uh, and thank you both for being here. Um, now, I want to dive straight in and talk about this topic and why it's important. I know we've been talking about DEI for a long time. Why, why is the conversation continuing? As Steve said, you know, good for business. Tell us a bit more from your perspectives on, on this topic. I know you're both very passionate about it. Yeah, I, I think we both are, so I'll, yes. be, I'll be really quick. So if you look at our overall uh, purpose, empowering inclusive future for all. It really is at the heart of everything that we do. Uh, we heard just now about the importance of driving innovation and when you have diversity and you have and you are inclusive, you can drive more innovation uh, within your teams. Absolutely, and um, you know, it's, it's our purpose. It's part of our purpose. It's part of our mission statement, actually. And um, you know, Cisco stands on a platform of delivering outstanding value yes. to our customers and partners. You can only do that if you look like our customers and partners. You are representing their diverse uh, thought processes and perspectives. And you know, to go back to Kim's innovation point, innovation comes out of seeing a problem from a certain perspective and fixing it and coming up with a solution for that. You can only be inclusive, you can only be diverse and, and broad with, uh, with our innovation if you represent all of those viewpoints. It's, it's kind of science, really. Absolutely, and you know, I've got a long list here of things that you do day to day at Cisco that are you know, super impressive, and I'm very grateful to have you both as leaders at our company. So Kim, you are the executive sponsor for EMEA Connected Asian Affinity Network. I could list 10 other ones. I know you are also the formal leader of our Global Women of Cisco um, community. And then Phil, you are also global sponsor for our CX DEI Council for the Connected Disability Action Network as well. So you're obviously very passionate about it. Where do you think your passion stems from for this topic? If I look at myself, um, I think it's really important uh, to have representation and feel like you're included. And uh, I can speak from experience uh, when I was promoted to uh, a vice president. I had so many people come to me and tell me, I can actually see it now. Yes. I, can, I see you and I know that I can do it. And uh, that makes me so happy and I feel it's very important to just open up that door and make sure that people can uh, follow me through it. That's so amazing to see. Like I, I'm one of those people when I look and I see people like Kim and I'm I, like. I have the door open for you. Yes, thank <laughs> you, thanks Kim. How about you Phil? When I see people like Kim, it inspires me as yes. well, by the way. <laughs> um, so my, my passion originally came from a family situation. So I have a, an autistic son. Um, and as he was growing up, I met lots of people who had defined the capabilities of my son through what he couldn't do, rather right. than what he could do, they'd, they'd assumed some things about him which weren't actually reflected in, in the person I knew. And at that point, I really had, a, had a, developed a passion for making non-represented voices be heard. And as I've you know, come into a business leadership position, I've understood how critical it is to get 
everybody's voice, not just heard, but included, mm -hmm. driving the strategy, being involved in the execution. Because it's, you know, we, we've talked a lot this week about, actually about, uh, about sustainability. Yes. I see, you know, that's the right thing to do for the planet. I see inclusivity as like sustainability for the human race. It's the right thing to do for everybody, Absolutely. every citizen of this planet. Every exactly. Citizen. Wonderful, thank you. So let's dive into some of the practical things that we do at Cisco. Hopefully it's going to inspire some of our viewers um, with you know, new ideas for their own organizations. Um, so can you share some ways that Cisco is promoting inclusivity in the workplace? Mm. Well, it starts with being engaged and being educated. So we have a, 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 an initiative called Proximity. Yes. And it does what it says yeah, in the title. You get proximate with people who don't look like you, don't feel like you, don't, don't uh, you know, identify like you. And you have a conversation and you educate yourself. You know, in a lot of ways, Kim and I are both professional allies. We don't have lived experiences of what it's like to be in each of the minority groups. Um, how do we know? Well, we find out. We get educated by the people who have that lived experience. So it really starts there. That's our platform for educating ourselves and the organization. I love that mindset. How about you, Kim? Oh, we have so many cool things at, uh, at Cisco Nish. I can start with our inclusive communities that we really want all of our employees to feel like they can be in a group where they, uh, that they can relate to. Uh, we even have our graduate program, which you were part of. I was, uh, and, very you know, proudly. We, we bring very talented uh, individuals in, and what's so great about that program is that we can bring a lot of diversity, uh, not just um, uh, male, female, but full spectrum diversity, and we're very, very uh, focused on that. And um, if you just look at all of the, the stuff that we're doing here, and if we talk about diversity and sustainability, it's, it's not just about the climate, it's about everything that we're doing uh, in total for our employees, for the communities, the smart cities, everything that, um, that will actually promote uh, inclusion and make people uh, feel uh, like they belong. Mm. For sure. Um, now you both have very large organizations, you have hundreds of people in your, in your teams. What would you say you do to inspire inclusion in your own leadership teams and what effect does that have? Mm. Well, I practice what I preach. Um, yes. If you look at my leadership team, uh, I have a very diverse uh, team and I hope that uh, I lead by example and people can, can see that I'm not just uh, talking the talk, I'm also walking the walk. Yeah. Same, you know, as leaders, Live it. Nail your colours to the mask. To the mast. You know, don't don't hide it. Celebrate it. Talk about it at every opportunity. You know, we are, we we both exist on the power of our teams. Yeah. If we're excluding talent from our teams because we're not connecting with them, shame on us. That, that we're, it's like fighting with one hand behind your back. Well, we're almost already out of time. I can't believe how yeah. quickly the time's gone. <laughs> but I just want to give you an opportunity to let our viewers at home or wherever they're watching from one call to action you have around this topic. Any thoughts? Um, I would say two things if that's okay. Yeah, sure. I'm in sales, I want to have two. <laughs> uh, number one, if you're here, please watch the rest of our inclusion, uh, Inspire Inclusion series. We do have some sessions today. And the second one is, go and, and just help someone. We have our multiplier effect, where we uh, ask everyone to find someone that they can sponsor or mentor. Uh, even if it's someone in your neighborhood, if you're volunteering, go out and help someone and open, that, open up that door for them. Thank you, Kim. Bell. Cisco Life has 16,000 people uh, in one place from every nation on the planet, probably. Go talk to someone. Identify someone who doesn't look like you. Talk to them. Gosh, I feel so energized going into the last day of Cisco Live. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me here in the studio and thank you for everything you're doing to be amazing role models for us. Thank you. thank you. Steve, back over to you. Thank you so much. Great interview, important interview. Great job, Kim. Great job, Phil. Thanks to both of you for bringing us this very important story and we're uh, really glad that you were with us today. You do great work for us here at Cisco every single day. Right now, we are going to play a fantastic innovation talk from this week on the women of impact who are disrupting the status quo to advance equity and inclusion. Aruva Ravishandran has a great, great panel with her. I hope you enjoy the iTalk. We will see you right back here on the other side. Here we go. Welcome everyone. We have an amazing set of uh, panelists here today. Uh, and so before we kick start the session, would love for you guys to basically say a little bit about your company, your role, 
and the journey which got you here. So let's start with you, Helen. Yeah, thank you, Aruna. So um, four and a half months now in Cisco. Um, I lead the collaboration business for Cisco across EMEA. Um, previous to that, I've held uh, numerous leadership roles across EMEA and also specifically in the UK. Um, what got me here was actually a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was asked to cover a maternity leave probably now around 17 years ago. And it was a uh, management role. And I said, no, th no, thank you. Um, I'm okay to be a salesperson. I enjoyed doing what I did and I enjoyed having that individual role. And the company said, please, just six months and then you can go back to your sales role. And I never went back. So um, a little bit of a mistake that got me here, but a whole big journey after that. Wow, how about you, Sandra? So <clears throat> my name is Sandra Hooper I'm at Adidas now for almost 16 years. Um, for my career side, I'm more of, of the application. So my career started as SAP consultant for finance and controlling. And at Adidas, I had several roles. Um, first uh, taking care of SAP, then tech retail. Um, I spent five years abroad in Asia. And when I came back, I had the opportunity to take over the infrastructure side, where I said, wow, that's really a difference. Um, but I wanted to take the challenge. <laughs> Um, I came back in a new role, and I'm in charge of network and digital workplace, as well as for end user support. So I really like to have these different, uh, or the variety of different jobs. Uh, my name is Kim Gronsma. I work uh, for the Dutch government. I also uh, started on a very limited one-year contract as a program manager. I was an independent consultant at the time. Um, but I rolled into a role of product owner for our video conferencing uh, capabilities. And uh, now I am an IT architect. Awesome. So let's take a few questions with respect to leadership. And we'll start with you there, Sandra. Okay. What are some of the challenges you actually faced when you moved on from an individual contributor role into a leadership role, a people management role? I think the biggest change is really to the transition from a manager into a leader, because it's not really to say, okay, I have to finish this task, that task, tell the members what they have to do, and really to um, see that you just tick all the boxes. I think as a leader, it's much more. You have to empower the team. You have to guide the team and coach the team. and also to step back, not immediately to go with your ideas into the discussion, also to let the team work out the, um, the solution. And when it comes then to the executive part, it's, it's another challenge because then you also have to translate from the technical side to a more maybe not so technical communication. And um, I, yeah, I have to say it was, was a really big change um, also from the, into the executive side then. How about you, Helen? Yeah, I mean, echo what Sandra said. You, you go very much into, you want to almost inform people what the solution is, as opposed to getting them to co come through as a manager and moving that into a leadership role. I think one of the areas for me was um, really making a network outside of my own business. So actually having a network like with these ladies um, outside of our own business to get the insight of what they're seeing in their industry, see what they're seeing in their organization and bringing that in. So the collaboration of the outside world is so important to bring that thought leadership back into your organization. Well, how about you? Um, well, what I really tried is to bring different parts of the government together. We have a um, you know, very scattered government and I work in the federal CIO office. So I try to bring everyone together, both on the technical side and on the business side, uh, to get us moving forward in the same direction. And that uh, can be a challenge. Yep, so challenging. Let's go a little bit deeper. Give a little bit of more color on specific challenges you have actually faced as a woman. Uh, well, I have recently had a manager um, who became more hard of hearing when you are a woman and also when you are under 50, and I am both. <laughs> so that was a challenge, uh, but what was really interesting to me is that uh, a few colleagues who I have a really trusting relationship with really stepped up to the, fl up, stepped up to the plate to defend me and uh, put me back in the position where I think I belong. Mm. 
Yeah, on, my, on my side, what I realized is that I became a little bit famous for this firefighting. So <coughs> whenever there was um, a task to solve, independent if it's in Germany or outside, I went there maybe as a short-term assignment, I came back. And, but somehow it was never possible to make the next step because everyone expected that I'm ready. Ah. And then I, ex um, I saw with my colleagues, they got a chance. So more the, the men, they got a chance to grow into the new role. When I said, oh, I'm interested in this. Oh, you're not ready. Maybe you need a little bit longer. Uh, but fortunately now with my current job, it was my current manager who even said the same to me. I said, Sandra, I cannot understand why we sent you everywhere to be a firefighter, but we never enabled you to make you the next step. And now it's more than deserved to make it. And why other men always get um, the chance just to grow into it and why we are not giving it the same to women. I said, wow, I was so impressed about my manager. So, um, but this is also a challenge that I see as a woman that we have to be somehow ready. Yeah, and for me, um, I think it's the multiple personas. So one, one positive that came out of COVID was this, this department for me. Mm. I was a leader in a business and I was a wife and I was a mother. So I had three different personas. And before COVID, you kept them separate. So if I was ever on a video call, my children would never come into my room. My husband would never walk past to go and make the coffee or to put the oven on for the, for the children's dinner. And, um, and it, it seemed to be a, a weakness if you did show your outside life to, to, to the organization. And COVID really opened that up. So COVID, we're having children at home, Mm. It opened that up. It made you feel much more relaxed that you are actually a mother or a wife or a friend and you are actually working in your home or in your in your home. So you're inviting work into your home and it brought this confidence. And I see that now across many, many people with teams, even if it's a dog and the dog walks in the room, rather than trying to shush them out, people embrace it, get the dog on the lap and they carry on talking. And that's really helped relationships in the business, but also it's helped me feel much more confident in my approach that I'm not trying to stop people understanding who I really am. Yeah, it did an amazing job. That is one of the advantages of COVID, I have to say, blending your personal life and your professional life. And also, I think people have changed in terms of empathy, right? Like you said previously, I'm a mother of two girls. Nobody would come into the room. You always keep your doors locked. So that was one of the positive benefits of COVID, I would say. Uh, let's now talk about DEI. At Cisco, we have tremendous amount of diversity, equity, and inclusion practices. And some of them are really wonderful in terms of being able to create community for men, women, and in various different sectors across the board, as well as you know, women in engineering. We have a lot of chapters over there. I would love to hear from you on any best practices you have specific to Adidas as well as the Dutch government when you think about DEI. So let's start with you, Sandra. Yeah, so um, DEI is very important for Adidas. And I just saw a um, um, note this morning that in Adidas we have over 100 different nationalities working for. And we have a department also reporting to our board member on HR side taking care of DEI. And we had, for example, last year also the week of inclusion um, was a full week focusing on DEI activities, speeches, um, workshops, workouts. We have a tool book um, that we can take to discuss topics with our teams. And um, it's an ongoing journey and already new events are planned for this year. Um, we have a lot of collaboration also with um, handicapped um, sports people, they are invited to the campus um, to speeches to tell more about their story, about inclusion. Um, so for us, inclusion or DEI is not only male or female, it's also the different nationalities, handicapped people, and so on. So a lot of activities. How about on your side? Um, well, we have a, a couple of initiatives, and I think one of the nicer ones is they used to have a very old demographic in the government, and they had um, a really nice uh, a youth club 
for everyone under 35, so youth was kind of relative. <laughs> but uh, you are young in the government when you're under 35. Uh, but it was across the whole government. So it really helped um, make uh, personal connections. And that also helps put different perspectives uh, back into other parts. OK, so let's talk about another important concept with respect to you know, a life event, which happens to many of us, which is around taking parental leave. Um, I have two daughters, and when I took parental leave, this was eons ago, probably about two decades ago, you know, those policies were not there in the company I actually worked with, and so I had to, even if I had to breastfeed my children, my older daughter was born premature, and so I had to breastfeed her for at least one year old, and so it was so tough, I had to go to the restroom in order to pump breast milk, but now if you look at how companies have evolved. There is a lot of measures which are really awesome in order to help you know, parents come back and also feel safe and secure knowing that the company's got their back. So we'll start with you first on anything you can actually share with respect to being a parent. Yeah, and I think I'm going to flip this because it, in the past it's always been around a female having the time after having a, a, a baby. But actually, being a female in that position, you have, especially in the UK, there's a two-week parental leave for the father, which means that for the first two weeks, you've got your father, the father there, you've got the baby there, but you're in a different world at that particular stage. You are, you know, sleep deprived and everything else. It's actually after then that you need the help and the support. And from a, from a male's point of view, they go back to work and they're leaving their wife and their, their child at home and they're supposed to switch right back into work mode. So for me, I, what I love with Cisco is that we actually offer that parental leave to both male and female and they can actually take that parental leave for a number of years after having the, uh, after having the child. So it takes the pressure off that if you do <coughs> encounter challenges, the male knows that they can go and support the, the, the female and, and, the, and the baby and child, but also, again, have the ability to open up and actually not see it as a weakness, but actually see it as part of life. And, and with Cisco's programs that we have around that parental leave, I think that is what attracts certain talent to our organization, because you are allowed to actually have your life, have your support, and have your career. So in that respect, I think, the, the men get treated a little bit differently, and I think they, we, we, every organisation needs to rise up and bring that man in the um, in the front fold. Mm. Anything specific with Adidas? Yeah, maybe for Adidas, I see, I see two points. Um, the one point is um, I cannot talk to for for all locations at Adidas, but for example in Germany and I know also in the US, we have a specific kindergarten, so next to the office, so that the parents can um, bring the kids there for the day and then picking up them up in the evening. But on the other side, I think it's also very important as we as a manager are supporting um, the, the, the mothers or um, the one who's taking care of the kids. Um, when I took over the position, I had one conversation uh, with one um, team member, so she worked half time and she told me, ah, yeah, but I can never do, <coughs> make some career here because I work only half time. I said, why? Yeah, because I work only 50% and I was very shocked about this because then I also saw that people scheduled meetings in the afternoon, even she's not working in the afternoon. And I think this is also kind of education to say, please respect her working times, schedule the meetings in the morning, maybe assign her to projects where she can fully um, work on it. Um, and happy to say that now she, um, she got promoted. So it works also as a mom, but it's also need to be supported by the management and by us as well. Yeah, that is really true. I encountered it myself. We have, uh, of course, your specific med leave. Uh, in uh, the Netherlands, it's also the very broad arrangement for breastfeeding. When your child is up to a year, you get to spend two hours per day uh, uh, pumping if you need and there needs to be also a specific room for that so bathrooms are not allowed there needs to be a specific uh, room with a fridge uh, so you're well fully fully equipped uh, uh, to do that and also keep the breast milk safe and then after the uh, mat leave there's also still a parental leave both for men and women mm -hmm. um, so I'm taking that now one day a week so I work uh, three days instead of four um, but it needs some uh, management encouragement, like you said, because there were colleagues who were every week forgetting I don't work on Monday, but, uh, well, they got it into their heads now, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> 
So now let's move on to the second topic, which is on hybrid work. Right, so hybrid work has its pluses, <coughs> sorry, and minuses. Uh, one of them is there has to be rituals because if people are working from home, how do managers ensure that people are really working from home? Uh, here within Cisco, we have established a whole bunch of rituals where people can actually check in uh, digitally with their manager. Uh, in addition to that, we used to have something called Cisco check-in every month that used to happen. So Chuck and the entire leadership team would be there to listen to the employees. So that basically brought a lot of trust. Trust is really important when you think about hybrid work, at least for us. would love to hear how are you managing hybrid work? And before you start, it would be great to know your hybrid work policy. <laughs> At Cisco, we have adopted a real good hybrid work policy. And we don't mandate people coming back into the office. Mm -hmm. Because for us, office needs to be a magnet, not a mandate. So it would be wonderful to know what kind of best practices you have. And we'll start with you, Kim. Uh, well, our official policy <laughs> is that you can work wherever you want. They call it uh, activity-based working, where you can choose what location suits your activity best. But, um, well, in practice, I had a manager last year, an interim manager, who was um, basically against hybrid working. Every time he saw my face, he said, I haven't seen you in a while. How are you? <laughs> like, I've been sick or something. I mean, I was just working from home for three days. <laughs> so I think uh, that is something that really, you know, kicked me in the head a little bit, that you can have a policy, but you also need to live by it. Uh, and that really uh, is a culture thing, because I see now the culture in my team is changing towards that. And I don't like it, but I haven't found a way to do anything about it yet. Mm -hmm. Sounds Great. So in, <laughs> in Adidas, um, we have the policy to be in the office for three days per week. First? Three days per week. Uh, what is interesting, because it's more or less the same what it, how it was before COVID. Mm -hmm. We were very flexible. People were very happy. Now we have exactly the same, and people are very unhappy. <laughs> so it's also because people get used to work from home. And now we have more the challenge to motivate people to come into the office. So there are different aspects. So from the company perspective, um, in, in Germany, they build more on the campus, try to make the campus attractive, even building a swimming pool. Um, whoever needs a swimming pool. But um, this is really to make it attra attractive. From my point of view, is also ensure that people have fun when they come in the office. Um, so we have every second month um, in the team some events um, that people gather together. They see that, oh, how nice it is to have a conversation, to meet people on the co um, other colleagues on the um, coffee machine and have some chats. Um, but it's, it's quite challenging because you have on the one hand side the people who doesn't like it at all. Mm. And you have the ones who really appreciate to meet and to talk. Um, but I also see that more and more people coming into the office. Got it. In fact, that validates. We recently did a study mm -hmm. in nine different countries here in Emir. We're actually launching it tomorrow here at Cisco Live. And that study told us that 79% of employers and 74% of employees actually want to come back into the office. So mm -hmm. things are definitely changing on that side. Another question, again, pertaining to hybrid work, you know, if, you're, if you already know your coworkers and you've already built a lot of relationships, then you know, it's easy to carry that forward when you're actually doing hybrid work. But if you think about the upcoming, the early in career, people who join <coughs> fresh out of college, they haven't formed those relationships. So it's really tough to build those relationships over video. So talk to me a little bit about how you think managers and people should be thinking about it. And also in your case, you can talk about you know, your companies and we'll start with you, Helen. Yeah, so I think um, <coughs> if you're looking at the young, younger generation, um, everything's digital. So they, I, I can even class myself in this younger generation now because my mobile phone is constantly in my hand and everything I do is on my mobile phone, whether that is banking, whether that is work, et cetera. And the younger generation are exactly the same. And it wasn't until I joined Cisco and I started to use WebEx that I actually saw the opportunity of taking all of your communications out of Outlook and making them much more digital, much more sharp and quicker. And what I've seen is that that's regular check-ins. 
So you are literally always on with your, with your team. So if you're a younger generation and you want to know something, you just post a message and it all comes through, through back. Mm -hmm. And that experience makes them much more relaxed. The experience makes them much more, it's an informal experience so they can go and find out who they need to talk to, they can post a message. And it makes them feel much more part of the organization and business. So I think tools and applications that really, really hit home with them, helps to bring, bring them into the org and helps them with their trust. Um, and that where, you know, work, your workplace is not a place, it, it, it's the how. And the WebEx app for me absolutely takes us down that path. Okay. So, if, you know, like I said, one of the key things, especially for early in career, but for everyone across the board, is this concept of having a mentor and a sponsor. The difference between a mentor and a sponsor, a mentor is someone you actually choose, meaning that if I want a mentor, you know, I'll potentially go and ask someone whether they'll be willing to be a mentor, or your companies could have mentorship uh, philosophies which will basically match you with a mentor. A sponsor is someone who actually chooses you. You don't get to choose a sponsor, the sponsor gets to choose you, and they'll represent you, they'll speak for you, and they'll sponsor <coughs> you within the organization. And uh, give me examples if you have had that experience of either being a mentor or a sponsor or actually being a mentee or a sponsee. You can pick whichever you want. And maybe this time we'll start with you. With me? Um, so we have a mentoring program. So we have a platform, a database, where everyone, a mentee, can sign in and say that this person is interested in and then somehow get matched. Um, Honestly, I've never seen this in life. So um, it was more out of HR activities that um, a specific mentorship or um, activity was, was triggered. I was a mentee as well, as well as a mentor. Um, to be honest, I was more a mentor um, and was a very, very interesting journey. Um, and definitely um, very important to have this established in the company and I would love that we spread it a little bit more and promote more people and also to motivate really to use the platform because the platform is there. But I can also imagine that some of the employees, they simply don't know it and um, never used it. Anything else to add or share? No, thank you. <laughs> okay. I've got something to add. Okay. So um, again, it comes back to your, your, your points mm. around culture. So you can put a program out there, but if your yeah. culture doesn't embrace it, it sort of falls flat. And I remember when I was, uh, I, I had, a, men I had a, a, a mentor and um, in a line of business that I was in, that I, I really believed that this particular female would be the person that could really help me. And in our first interaction, she turned around and said to me, you've got me for six months and that's it. That's all I ever give out, six months. And straight away, that was just a really negative experience to think that this, this to her is just a tick in the box. This is not something that she wants to really, really go into. So I knew before we even started, it wasn't really going to be a, a, a flourishing program between me and her. Um, and I flipped that forward to when I was then a mentor and you learn what not to say and you learn how to embrace this. And for me, it's that reverse mentoring. When you can actually get something from who you're mentoring and that they can give you something else, you both have got the investment to go forward with. So anyone who's doing this, I encourage that reverse mentoring and asking the person that you're mentoring to give you some insight as to what they're going through as well, because that really helps the relationship. I also found, you know, adding to what you said is, it's great to create a ritual, right? Like a particular time you and your mentor are going to meet each other. And many a times, if you don't have matching philosophies, it's okay to ask someone to be a mentor. What is the worst thing they can say? They'll say no. Mm -hmm. But if they say yes, you actually got a very good mentor from whom you could actually bounce off ideas and you can learn from. I did that early in my career and which has helped me tremendously across the board. So but let's maybe, go. But, but I just can add something that um, it's important that there's also the willingness. For example, we had a top-down decision to really, um, okay, everyone now gets a mentor and the people were assigned. And from this, from my point of view, is not successful because when there is just a volunteer <laughs> mandatory um, assignment, um, I think that's not um, successful at the end. So we have six minutes less. Wow, this goes very fast. We'll go to the last topic, which is about challenging the status quo. So disrupt 
uh, so in order to basically disrupt the organization, you have to actually challenge the status quo, I would say. Uh, and so when you challenge the norm, it can also lead to remarkable innovation, <coughs> uh, but it also comes with its own challenges because people are not usually uh, easy when you basically question the status quo and the norm. So give a couple of examples in terms of, in your own career, if you have one, on where you actually broke the glass ceiling in terms of being able to challenge the status quo. Can we start with you, Helen? Yeah, so I'm a really big fan of challenging the status quo. Um, and, and the reason is, is, is down to one thing, and it's just curiosity. So it's understanding why it's actually in place. And if people can't articulate the why or the what comes from that why, then I try and get people to think in a different way. Um, and, and for me, it's, it's all about the organization that you work for. So an organization like Cisco, for example, it's very large, it's got many, many different parts to Cisco. And I always try and bring out to whatever conversation I'm having, which is, will the customer see it in that, that way? So we have got an idea as to how we want to run, but have we asked the customers, does this actually give you the benefit or does this give you the value? We were just talking, Kim, about you could go and get any form of sales intel from any website. You don't want the sales intel, you want the actual detail because that's what changes your business. And I think for us, it is around the case of just because you've always done it one way doesn't mean, mean it's the right way. So keep asking the questions of, does that make sense in today's world? Because today's world's very different to that four years ago. But is my customer really getting something from me that is around that true partnership? And I don't ever want to go to a customer and talk at them. I want to listen. And, and that is what builds up that, that relationship. So again, uh, again, it comes back to, to your point, Kim, when you're a female and you're challenging that, it can sometimes be quite dismissive. Mm -hmm. um, and we just have to be repetitive in what we're saying. And, and it is always around outside value coming in. And I think if you, know, if you feel very strongly about that, is to basically get a whole sense of people who can actually support you yes. in the decision-making process. Awesome. Anybody else wants to add anything else with respect to challenging the status quo? Because Yeah, when you challenge the status quo, I've learned uh, from a, a very great mentor that you should not be uh, afraid of people resisting you. Because I was only working for three months for the CIO office uh, when I tried to change so much that two other CIOs of the government uh, took it up on themselves to travel to my CIO to complain about me personally in one day. Wow. And I was working there for three months. I mean, they could still get rid of me. And he called me in for a meeting. So I was like, oh no, this is it. You know, this is going to be it. And he was talking about something else entirely. So I just casually asked at the end of me like, oh, by the way, how did those meetings go? He said, yeah, Kim, I think you're doing a great job. And if you change something, people will always complain. So I gave them some coffee and sent them back downstairs. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. So, and I always took that with me that some, sometimes people get upset, but I try to learn from it. I learn from it now to ask why are they upset and try, uh, try to get us to work together instead of being upset with each other because that doesn't get us anywhere. Yeah. 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 I think that's um, just to, to um, add what you just said. To make this, it's important to have also the environment, the trusted environment, to enable people also to speak up, not to be shy or afraid of it, uh, because otherwise they will not be in the position to challenge. Um, and because we know that every challenge makes it even better, but the trusted environment is very, very important. Okay, so we have one last question and then I'm going to turn it to the audience to ask any questions of the panelists. If you were to meet your younger self, you know, 20 years ago, what advice would you actually give your younger self? Who wants to take it? Um, I would say, uh, tell myself, stay authentic and listen to your gut and not always to the brain. <laughs> How about you, Helen? I mean, exactly the same as that. That there was a, um, there was a time in my career when um, I had a mentor who advised that I should change my accent because um, 
<laughs> my accent was from the north of the UK and not the south. And it's very, very hard to change your accent unless you pay quite a lot of money. Um, <laughs> and um, and, and for, for a moment, I was thinking of ways to go and do that. And it was actually a grandparent that said, don't ever change because it's not you and you'll come across as fate. So, um, so very much the case of uh, be your authentic self and that will drive you through. And not everybody will like you and not everybody will hate you. But if you can do a purpose and if you can have that purpose, you'll get more of a following in that way. How about you, Kim? Yeah, the same with authenticity. People try to change you be, because what I learned that, especially when you're a younger woman, as soon as you speak up, yep. you are viewed as overly emotional or something, but you're not. You can be driven and ambitious. And I mean, those are good emotions in my opinion. And uh, people are always like, yeah, you should try to suppress that and wear a blue suit. And uh, well, I have given in to that at times when I was younger and now I wish I wouldn't have. I'll add to this, I concur with everything you guys said, but I would also say that, you know, I would tell my younger self to take more risks. You know, I grew up in India, which is a very conservative, we are usually not good about taking risks, but I think there is, no, with, with no pain, there is no gain. Mm -hmm. And having the mentality of being able to take risks, maybe you'll, but you'll learn something from it. Maybe it'll not work out that way, but it is a great lesson to basically take forward in your life. And welcome back to the Cisco TV studio. I'm Steve Multer. We are so glad to have all of you with us here on the live stream. I hope you enjoyed that great talk on disrupting the status quo. How do we advance equity and inclusion? Our thanks to Aruna, Sandra, Kim, Helen for a great talk. Here in the text here, we really understand disruption is so vital if we want to deliver value to customers, gain that leadership in the marketplace, and the reason is that diversity on our teams ends up creating diversity in our thinking and in our creativity, the way that we approach and solve problems together all over the world. We have to embrace that mindset to creating inclusive environments, policies, cultures. Great messaging, hope you'll join us in that effort. We truly do appreciate it. Remember, keep reaching out to us on social media using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. Our social media team is that way, I always just make up a number. Let's say, let's, we're going to call it 500 feet uh, in that general direction, waiting to hear from all of you. So whichever social media platform you prefer, please continue to reach out. If you hear something in one of the talks that you really like or something that inspires or excites you or you see a photo or uh, you see Rob out on the show floor doing something very cool, you want to comment on it, please do that. Just remember to include that hashtag, Cisco Live EMEA. We appreciate that. If you have missed any part of the broadcast, any of the value we've been bringing to you, it is all waiting for you, no worries. It's all online at CiscoLive.com, so you can go and check that out at your leisure. And right now, we are going to head out into the world of solutions where Rob Boyd has found one of our venerable areas. I can't believe we haven't been there yet, Rob, but you found it at last. Absolutely. Well, sometimes I'm trying to figure out if I'm finding it or if it's finding me because it's <laughs> law enforcement. Law enforcement tends to find me. But either way, this is Igor. Igor is a police commissioner with the Polish police headquarters. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. It's true. And here we've got an emergency communications vehicle. Can you explain what it is that we're showing here and, and why is it so important? Yes, this is really police vehicle, and I should say I am a real policeman. We are working with Cisco near. 20 years, Cisco bringing to our, our, our company a lot of stuff for secure and IT. And in the May 2023, uh, Cisco write a memorandum with chief of our police to bought our this vehicle. So idea of this vehicle was from 2022, from October, when the Polish police humanitarian mission go to the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And all these advices and ideas was developed in Ukraine. When Cisco came to ask, to us, ask what we want to do from this digital acceleration. And we told them that we need to build a car the similar like was in the war zone. Yeah. So as we do that, we give the communication car like this, we give the communication advices, and Cisco give the for all. Okay. The main of the system is the Cisco router SD van, is the heart of the system. So wait, one more time, Cisco router what? SD van. It's this advice. Uh, SD van. Yes. yes. Okay. It's the heart of the system. 
it can provide communication to our headquarters by remotely. Okay. We have four ways to communication with our systems in Warsaw. We have dirty internet, Elon Musk internet. Yeah, let's look at this. I'm going to explain it, and then we'll have Steve cover up to it. Let's start with what's here in these Pelican boxes. We'll look down here. What's this? We have Tetra BS1 radio. Okay. May click remotely with Cisco SD WAN, and third part, it's it, it, it it's I think TP Link or 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 Pep Link. Yes. So you build so these self-contained packages that are communications across multiple our, network types? Built for all these advisors, Cisco, by their partner, but the idea is ours. We can use this radio communication system anywhere we want, putting to the satellite system, and we can, for example, using this in the environment where there's nothing communication at all. Yeah. Yes? I tell you, hold that thought one second, because I'm going to say, just look down here, Steve. See, everything is designed to just be plug and play. You get out on site. You don't have engineers with you setting this up in the yes. field. You need yes, to be up and field, going. For the field, for the field soldier or for the field policeman, turning the ignition, start the antenna, and working. You know, three steps. I think you uh, told me. Yes, yes, three steps, and this we can use in every part of the world if we only want. In the car, we have two tasks. All right. Well, explain what we're looking at here in the back. We've got the. Uh, we'll swing around here, Steve, and take a look at these con this connectivity for power. Really? We can take the power from the three steps. Outside, we have generator here, and we have battery here. The car, without any, any power, can work four hours for the maximum peak of power, four hour max. But we have three and a half kilovolts generator. It can work steadily and on the move. And we can also upgrade this car for solar battery up here. Oh, nice. Yes. We are not using this f f because we have no sun like this, but we can upgrade any time we want. Okay. That's excellent, because I, I have an electric hybrid truck I always like to mention every Cisco Live, but you've got more connections than I do, so I'm a little bit jealous of, of that. But I got more 110, you got the 240. All right, so coming back around here, you've got this huge mast. Yes. I don't think that's a standard option on the yes. Hyundai yes. van, yeah? Uh, moving by the air, it can be seven meter tall plus antennas. We can turn it on and turn it turn it off. Oh, cool. I'll the play with that later. <laughs> the, right. car, the car can uh, be a standby point, and we can also use it on the move. Oh, we wow. have we have can communication on the move. For example, we can make in a convoy like radio communication bubble. We are going in the convoy, and we uh, brought to our guys the communication bubble with. A secure, secure radio. Here, let's step back a little bit. Let Steve poke in there. Bring that light over while he sticks in there. And I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit, even if he's not looking at it directly, what all is in there that okay. is important to point out? Here, this silver case is our generator, and on the left side are uh, generators' advisors. On the down, as you see here, it's Tetra BR2 radio. Up here is GUI from the generator, and the third part is our radio patching system. We have three systems of uh, radio communication here, and we can work with three systems together. For example, firemen, uh, policemen, and uh, soldiers have three radios in three systems. We can make like this that they will hear each other. Wow, that, okay, and that's a huge issue, right? Because emergency response vehicles, I know this from the American side as well, as we go into certain situations, usually disaster situations, and all of a sudden nobody can communicate, all the yeah. first responders. Communication is the first thing to do. So we're going into the action. Three members of three groups are talking to each other. Higher, you see this is heart of the system is SD-1, SD-1 by Cisco. And from the SD-1 by Cisco, we get this, like I say, four type of communication. I'm going to have to cut you off on that one because we're running out of time. But Igor, thank you so much. I understand that following the show, you're going to drive this yes, actual to van to, to the border? To Warsaw and go to work, yes. To Warsaw? Yes. Okay, and then on to the... going to work. Oh, going to work. Okay. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for your service. Appreciate that. And guys, we'll go back to the studio now. Thank you so much. Great interview. Thanks to Igor as well and the entire emergency response vehicle team. Very cool stuff. We are headed into our first innovation talk of the day. Actionable steps to manage your journey to net zero using sustainable capabilities across our Cisco portfolio. We've got Denise Lee and Gordon Thompson on deck with us right now to talk about the internal and the external challenges that we are facing today, like energy cost instability, demands for regulators, investors, employees. These have all driven business leaders exactly like you to increase your focus on sustainability recently, which is exciting. More organizations are prioritizing sustainability. Here's the thing though. 
you may not know where to start. Here we go. Morning. All right. Nice to see so many of you so early on a Thursday morning. <laughs> or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're tuning in. Yes, oh, yes. true. Right. We've yeah. got a big virtual audience as well. Well, I am thrilled to be here with Gordon Thompson um, to dive into the solution sets uh, across our portfolio. Um, should we dive right in? I think we should dive right in, and I'm delighted to be here with Denise Lee as well. <laughs> All right. So. Look, we know around the, the world, there's a lot more regulatory pressure that continues to increase. We have to the tune of 130 countries that now have committed goals around net zero to meet. But if you go and ask a lot of the organizations, how are you going to get there? You still see a vast majority of them looking a little fuzzy. Uh, we have some ideas on how we can do that with maybe scope one and two. And then you talk about that big scope three, if you know scope accounting, a lot of the measurement gets a little bit fuzzy. We know that CIOs and C-suite across the globe are looking at this is a big business imperative. And then there's this little thing called AI that has blown up over the last 12 months. And we know that when it comes to the network and it comes to the compute power and performance, it's going to hit this industry um, far more and the role this industry has to play. So as we think about how we balance all of these things, I have yet to meet an organization that has a set aside large sum of money to go solve all these sustainability strategies and plans. They are being asked to do it inside the envelope of their current business. They're being asked to come up with the business cases to maybe do a little bit of incremental funding. But it's always this balance of how do we take sustainability and all these goals we need to get to. And I balance that a lot of times with how do you get something better, faster, and cheaper? Usually you can pick two out of the three, but it's very rare to get three out of the three. You can get three out of the three when you take into consideration technology. And it's actually technology and innovation that's going to help us leapfrog and not just do the incremental changes and incremental savings to energy efficiency, but it's actually going to help us get to those bigger commitments. So at Cisco, we're looking at this in a lot of ways. We're looking at overall strategies and our plan for possible to help our customers with clean energy transition and regenerative ecosystems. We know that we need to decarbonize, and that's not just a Cisco problem, that's an all of us problem. We know that we need to build products that are more circular designed. We know we need products to come back in order to more responsibly recycle, reuse, and remanufacture them. Right? Our supply chain is number one or number two ranked in the world, depending on the year. And we're able to do all of these things so that 100%, 99.98 to be exact, a percent of our products can be recycled, remanufactured, and reused. And if you don't believe us, right outside uh, these, these halls are our sustainability zone where we are actually doing active teardowns of our product. But when it comes to the products and the solutions in our portfolio, this is where we want to deep dive today. When we think about across our engineering portfolio, we have four key focus areas. Energy management, which is how you measure. And if you don't measure anything, you can't fix it, you can't put a plan against it, you can't credibly get to net zero. So we're working across our portfolio to standardize on five key energy metrics. There are a lot of new advancements and um, commitments we've made in, in the last couple of months that we are able to share with our customers and partners at this point. We then translate that into software, and with software for sustainability, the immediate impact that can be had for our customers and partners to apply the practices of observability and visibility into those insights and actions lead us to automation with software. With modernizing hardware, it's everything from the materials that go into our products, right, the embodied carbon itself, to the transportation of that product, how we use it, and what we do after. We're also looking at power distribution. We're also looking at liquid cooling in the future. And all of these things include a broader ecosystem of IT and OT across the campus and the data center space. And then of course, business transformation, right? We think about as a service models, we think about how we're going to monetize and how do we make sure that the ROI and the TCO cost of going greener or refreshing at the right time or implementing these software policies makes sense for our customers. 
Gordon, can you talk to us about this shift in innovation strategy at Cisco? Yeah, by all means. You know, Cisco's like every other company. We don't have an extra budget to go and set aside to be able to become a more sustainable company. We have to think much more purposefully around our innovation strategy as a company. We have to do it within the same budget. And the reality is in Cisco over the last few years, you've seen us move from what I would say is a traditional innovation strategy, which was always about feature development. How can I put more and more and more features into every single one of my products? We were always focused on just trying to build products that way. The reality is when we put all of these features into products, our customers were only adopting on average about 17% of those features. So that wasn't really a very sustainable innovation approach. We've moved to what we call a much more purposeful approach to innovation now. And that's allowing us to be more strategic and thoughtful in terms of how we're building our products and what we're putting into those products. And the reality is what you see Cisco doing now is being purposeful really around these five areas. Sustainability being at the heart of it. How do we build more sustainable products? But at the same time, we're very focused on things like AI and data to make our products even more efficient and more effective as we move forward. We're recognizing that to be more sustainable, we can't be proprietary based and we need to be more open uh, and we need to work with the ecosystem. While obviously we're looking at other things strategically like security and sovereignty. So our innovation strategy as a company has shifted significantly from what was just purely a feature development strategy into something that was is much more purposeful. And that's true of our acquisition strategy as well. If you look at this slide, this is specifically based towards the business that I operate in, the service provider business, but it's true across the whole organization. These are purposeful acquisitions that Cisco have made over the last few years, and they really break down into three key areas. They break down into an area where you, when you look at the, the green areas, these are really around driving sustainable and power efficiency into our product portfolio. When you look at the light blue areas, that's around automation in terms of how we do things quicker. And when you look at the dark blue icons, that's around data and observability. And really when you take data and observability together with power efficiency, you start to create something different. You start to create something special in terms of the innovation that we can drive to our customers. And this data thing becomes a big part of the broader strategy as well when we go back to telemetry. Yep, and that data thing I am so excited to tell and share at this conference that across energy management, the five metrics you see at the bottom are cu currently being standardized across Cisco's portfolios. They're being leveraged at a web capability layer for APIs for customers and partners to draw from for your own platforms and dashboards. And these five metrics we've pressure tested with many of our customers and partners, we believe will, will help baseline and solve most of the use cases that the customers need to start their journey, to understand what their goals are for net zero, where they're starting, and then how they can start moving towards energy optimization to get there. So you'll start to see these across our existing platforms in a web capability layer, as well as a capability that will be built into Cisco Networking Cloud. This will be the foundation at which across all of our solutions, we continue to build. So that, that's a, the energy management platform side. Now think about the hardware, the software, and the solutions that are being built in the, soft, the smart building space and the campus, all the way down to the service provider space and to data centers. So let's start with data centers. And we were, we were just here earlier in other parts of the conference talking about what a big energy draw data center is going to be. If you had an opportunity to listen yesterday to our guest keynote speaker, the founder of Siri, mm -hmm. data centers produce as much energy as the entire country of Italy. And that's only going up with AI. So if you think about Chris Cisco's entire end-to-end -end portfolio, we need to know what's happening from the dashboard perspective across our networking and our compute platforms with Nexus and Intersight. We're driving energy optimization into these platforms. Yesterday we heard from a customer that has successfully completed a DC microgrid for a data center. Yes, you heard that right. They have strategically located their data center next to renewable energy and it is an entirely closed off the grid DC microgrid for a data center. And they're measuring this and now they're also producing more uh, electricity than they are generating or than they're using. 
If you look across the partner ecosystem for a hybrid multi-cloud world, we know that with generative AI coming, we're still going to need the cloud. We also know there's going to be more colo and on-prem needed. So we're building these various partnerships to make sure that we can modernize infrastructure and the application layer. We, we have security in mind. And we announced a really big partnership with uh, NVIDIA and commitment on how we do this to future ready and future proof, proof us for AI in, the, in going forward. And the requirements, Gordon, as we know, the challenges of this are not in any one key area. Everything from the operational silos to the cost of retrofitting existing data centers to getting ready for liquid cooling. We know that some of the chips that are coming in the future can no longer be air cooled. So simple adding more power and, and racks to a data center is not going to suffice for AI. So what do, we, what do we do? We have a power problem in our data centers. We don't have a space problem, although we can help solve some of the rack density there as well. Mm. And we look at some of our customer examples. This is another customer example that leveraged the UCSX chassis uh, across their, their data center. And the overall reduction in footprint from a space perspective was 70%. Who wouldn't want to save 70% of space, right? But if you look at on the right-hand side at the actual metrics to operate that business, what we're seeing is an architectural shift from maybe three or four boxes in the future going to one. And that one is not only more energy efficient, it's more powerful in performance. And yeah. Gordon, when I think about all the data centers, it needs to run on a network. And yes. I, I love what we're doing with our service provider networks. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about internet for the future? I can, I can indeed. And uh, just finishing off on that comment there, back to in the data center, sometimes we don't have the budgets to do these upgrades. We've seen in a number of instances where the cost to move from older architecture technology into newer Silicon One technology, our customers are, are, are saving more every year in power and space savings than they are amortizing the cost of the project over a five-year period. So from that point of view, there's, there's real reasons why customers are making that shift now. But let's talk a bit more about um, where a lot of power is consumed, which is in the service provider networks. In Europe, the incumbent service provider in each country, so the largest service provider in each country, on average, is consuming 1% of all of the energy in that country. Right? When you think about how much energy they're consuming, they're thinking of two things then. They're thinking of how strategically can I be a greener company? How can I be better for the planet if I'm consuming all of that amount of energy? And secondly, they're saying to themselves, energy costs are really expensive. I need to find ways of significantly reducing the amount of energy that we run in our business. So we are helping our service provider customers thinking about how they reduce fundamentally their energy costs in four different ways. One is around network convergence. One is around what we call layer convergence. One is around giving them choice at the edge of the network with what we call service edge platform. And the final one comes back to that whole data telemetry conversation around how you use data better to make better business decisions. So I'm going to just click into each of these just to give you an idea of some of the things that are going on. First of all, around network convergence, what we're seeing here is traditionally when a service provider builds a network for 5G, they build a separate network at the edge of their network to accommodate all of that mobile traffic. At the same time, when they build a broadband network or a fiber to the home network, they build a separate network to connect all of those fiber cables from your home back into an aggregation point to feed back into their core network. And similarly, when they build maybe an enterprise or MPLS-based network, they do the exact same thing. So at the edge of their network, they have disparate you know, networks that ultimately connect into one, the only place where all that traffic comes together is in the core of the network. And so obviously you're having to lay out many, many devices at the edge of the network to accommodate each network service. Well, what software is allowing us to do now with something called segment routing or segment routing, depending on how you, how you say route or route, is allowing us to slice virtually all of those traffics independently, but through one box as opposed to through three boxes. And that's having a massive impact in terms of energy savings for our customers, service provider customers at the edge of their networks. And it's not having a, a, an impact negatively in terms of the performance they provide. Actually, when you have less boxes in your network, 
there is less points to go wrong, and it's actually improving overall performance. The second area we're focusing on is what we call layer convergence, and this is more in the core of the network. I mentioned earlier on that all of the traffic comes back to our core. Ultimately, that core is built by an optical network at the bottom that then connects into an IP layer above that. The optical network has always been terminated in its own optical network devices, transceivers that terminate that you have to power and manage, and that then connects into the IP layer above, the routing layer above. Well, Cisco's developed an optical pluggable, a ZR pluggable, that plugs an optic cable directly into the IP layer in the router. And that means you can get rid of your whole optical layer of the network. Now, many service providers in Europe are starting to do that. A couple of them have gone public in terms of the amount of energy savings they're saving in the core, notably Deutsche Telekom and Swisscom. On an, on a, and on average, in the core of their network, they're saving between 60 to 80 percent of the power consumption that they used to consume in the core of their network. So it's game-changing in terms of those capabilities. Thirdly, what we're starting to do is build services at the edge of the network. So rather than you know, deliver TV services from the core of your network and drive them out across the whole of your network, we start to pre-position those services, cache those services at the edge of the network. It has a number of benefits. One, certainly when you're watching things like soccer and the television, you don't have the delay. You don't have the two or three second delay as you'd normally see as you deliver internet-based you know, football services. There's nothing worse than getting a notification on your phone that your football team has scored and then seeing it two seconds later on, the tel on your streaming device. Uh, so things like that were changing significantly. We're moving more and more services to the edge. That means we don't have to stream as much traffic across the network, and that's saving on cost at the same time. And then the final thing, this game changer is really around um, data and how we use data to drive better SLAs across our networks. In the past, or in this new internet-based world, there isn't really a way to guarantee traffic flows in the way that we used to do on circuit-based connectivity like MPLS. So what our service provider customers have been having to do is over-provision those networks to be able to accommodate with all of, the, all of that internet traffic. What we can now do with data and our ability to see data from end user device all the way to the application is start to build up prod, uh, probability statistics around how much traffic is required to be able to route that traffic. Customers can start to set, our service providers can start to set SLAs, and fundamentally that allows us to operate differently. And that operation is really now coming together where what we see is we build this platform at the lower level around those four key areas that I mentioned a minute or two ago, and our service providers then create what we call service factories or applications that they sell to their customers. And the beauty now is we can start to connect those together. And that means we're much more efficient in terms of the amount of bandwidth we require to use across the whole network. And if we're more efficient in terms of bandwidth, we're obviously saving energy costs and becoming more sustainable at the same time. So there's loads going on in the, in the service provider space, in that core internet space, to change the game totally in terms of energy. But I know there's a lot going on as well in the campus and the building side as well. So would you like to talk about some of those, Denise? Absolutely. Those service providers connect everything to, from the data center to the campus. Um, our Silicon One chip going across our switching portfolio is helping to accelerate that along with that energy savings. And when we look at the smart buildings and workspaces, one of the things when, when I come to the European region that is actually resonates uh, even more with with urgency here is the Energy Performance Building Directive. Mm. And with the European Union Green Deal, there are as an estimated over 30 million buildings that need a retrofit to show above 15% energy consumption or energy efficiency in the next handful of years. And that number and that plan goes way up. If you're gonna build something new, it needs to have a specific rating, right? You need certain certificates. And these permits are now coming down from the regulatory side. The good news is at Cisco, we have this end-to-end -end portfolio in the campus that we've been you know, quietly incubating and working on for many, many, many generations. But now in the, the opportunity to bring that together with the Converge IT and OT space is more compelling now than ever. You have the confluence of a post-pandemic era 
of how do we work in these future offices? When do we go into the office? How many people in the audience go into an office five days a week? Exactly. How, go, how many go in at least one day a week? Okay. We're all navigating this new world. And energy management for a building, I don't know if you've ever been in a, a floor of your building where you might be one of two people in there, but every light is on and HVAC is on everywhere. We're trying to figure out from a, a networking perspective, how do we network energy the same way we network data? And how can we do that and connect it to the 30 plus building management systems that are in most of these buildings? Yep. So these building trends between how do we get them, you know, how do we get more and more energy to be renewable? Here at Cisco Live in the Netherlands, the Netherlands enjoys over 90% of renewable energy in their grid. Not every country can say that, but we're all working towards that. The health and wellness, how much better would you feel if you walked into a building and it gave you the stats of the CO2 and the humidity and the temperature and the cleanliness and the filtration of the air that was flowing through there, especially in the, in the flu season? So we're continuing to see more and more of this convergence. We're continuing to see more flexibility uh, built into the spaces that are being developed as more and more buildings are coming online for retrofit. Lead and well standards are being, the projects are going up and to the right in terms of exponential growth of the number of projects in the pipeline that are asking to be lead and well certified. And what, this, what happens at the building level that, that needs to be considered is those data uh, and power networks. Back in your hometown, one of the buildings I, I love to talk about is uh, 22 Bishop's Gate because they started building a 62-story building during the pandemic and realized people are never going to work the same way again. So they tore it down and they started from scratch with Cisco at the table as a way to incorporate the technology in the backbone. So one BMS system with connected to the 9K backbone, which we got to work on together, um, can help simplify the entire building. So everything from the security cameras to the HVAC systems to the blinds and the solar on the screen, uh, on, on, on windows, can all work together to provide better energy efficiency for the entire building, which now inhabits about 12,000 people on a daily basis. Right? And so when we think about the real estate environment, globally, we are at an all-time high vacancies in office space. 16%. Just one other thing there as well. You know, most of us are now starting to deliver green energy into our buildings, either through solar or other wind or other uh, ways. As we bring that energy into the building, it comes in as DC power. Yes. And what we do in traditional buildings is we convert it to AC power to distribute it around the whole building. And then when we get to the plug point, we turn it back into DC power again for us to connect into. There's a 20% conversion loss just in that conversion from DC to AC and back again. And the great thing about delivering power around your building across the data network means that you never have that conversion. It comes in as DC, it gets distributed as DC, and it comes out the plug point as DC. So straight away, before you start to do all of the intelligence that you're just about to talk about, straight away you're saving 20% of your energy consumption in the building just by distributing power across an ethernet cable as opposed to across a power cable. That's right, and all of the devices you see here are PoE enabled for exactly that reason, right? So as we're continuing to build out spaces, that distribution of power through PoE and the power of PoE um, is something that we are pushing in our smart building offers. When we look at the story of Pen1, um, this, this building has been retrofitted kind of first across Cisco's portfolio, and so we get to enjoy some of the data points. Over an eight month period, Gordon, they've saved 36% on average. Right, every second there are 8,000 data points coming off of all of the sensors that are built into many of our devices. So it's not that you're having to put extra sensors everywhere, they are built into our devices today. And that, that becomes the opportunity for us to not just save in the ongoing operating costs, we actually saved over $3 per square foot in the CapEx deployment because of the labor. Because cabling POE is something technically you and I can do because it's safe. Right? And so we're continuing to work on our portfolio of DC power distribution. We're continuing to work on our telemetry and the U UX of Cisco spaces and just creating a better environment so people are wanting to come back to the office. Um, and we're doing that across Cisco's entire real estate footprint around the globe. And to your point, we're doing that through the power of eth over ethernet. And you're gonna say, hey, this isn't anything new. We've had this for almost 20 years and you would be absolutely right. We have, 
We've had this for a long time, but here's what's interesting. Remember one of the building trends we showed up front is that con continued convergence of the ITOT space? Well, guess how many manufacturers we have today who are manufacturing LED lights with PoE enablement? That are doing monitors. If you can look over it, what Thin Labs has done just outside in, in sustainability zone. You can have an entire computer built into a monitor, all PoE enabled. Solar on blinds. Same thing, PoE enabled. Now you can have a small microgrid of blinds that have solar going right into um, automation of blinds, automation of desks, and your LED lights. So we're wor working at how do we connect all of these new devices that are coming online to make rooms even more modular than, than they are today. So you're not even having to drill holes in walls because you can have things that are configurable all with DC distribution. And for a fun energy lesson for those who, who may not be as familiar with the benefits of you know, direct uh, electricity and why we're only deploying a lot of this now, brief history lesson, uh, AC power has been around a lot longer. It's safe. It's in all of our legacy systems. And depending on where you are in the world, you know, you've got 110 in the US, US 220 out here. We, we know these are our traditional power systems. And that requires the conversion rates that you were talking about. In the yep. data center, there's at least three or four times of conversion to get it to the rack. DC power has been around for a long time as well. Thank you, Tesla. And PoE, 20 years. 380 volt DC has been around also for a long time. And for those who don't know, 380 volt DC is natively what is in our wind, solar, and fuel cells. But who here feels really comfortable managing and deploying and cabling 380 volt DC? Exactly. Um, we're really excited that Cisco continues to be on the innovative side of this, and the same engineers who developed PoE 20 plus years ago have been part of patents and many dozens of patents around new technologies that are helping to change standards out there. And there's a new class of power called Class 4 Fault Managed Power that has been put in the National Electrical Code in the US, which sits under the Fire Protection Agency, right? So it's all about around safety. And this continues our innovation around power distribution. What's interesting about class four fault managed power, it's about 450 volts, Gordon, with unlimited wattage, and it's touch safe. Okay. So it's class four power, it's a new class of power, but it's touch safe. Now, this is not something Cisco is actively selling today, that's not the point. The point is there's innovation out there and there's new things on the horizon that are written in the standard bodies that are starting to change. So remember, if you were around the industry back when, when PoE came out and how long some of that has taken to, to be adopted across all of these different ecosystems, now imagine we have something that's better, faster, and cheaper in the standard bodies, how quickly will this be deployed? Now we need that efficiency, right? Now cost is at a premium. And so it's really exciting to think about innovations that are coming up across not just our hardware and software core part of our portfolio, yeah. but in the industry when we look at power distribution uh, and what comes next in DC power. When I think about where we are today and where you might be in your journey today, how many feel really comfortable with the baseline of energy management and measurement off of all the telemetry in your networks? For those not in the room, there's no hands raised. So please start this journey with us with energy management as we continue to deploy these core pieces of our telemetry and make that available for all of our customers and the install base and our platforms. Keep in mind, it starts with measurement. And as we, we deploy these different solutions, more and more use cases will beco become available as new innovations become available, as new products become available, right? As the Silicon One chip bleeds across the rest of our switching portfolio, as new software capabilities come up that have immediate deployment for always ready, not necessarily always on. And we're doing that more and more with our Cisco networking cloud vision. But when we think about what we're doing to prepare for tomorrow, we see a lot of data centers now asking the question about liquid cooling. We're working with a lot of the co-location um, providers around the world because we know we need liquid cooling. No more raised floors, no more huge chillers, direct to chip liquid cooling. And when I think about what's, what's coming in the future, we know that Cisco is not just a technology provider and partner for you, but we are actually devising programs and incentives for every step in that life cycle across the journey whether it's stimulus funding with global funding offices around the world to help you take advantage of the 11, yes, 
$11 trillion of global stimulus money across 15 countries that we've identified to help on this specific journey. Or our refresh program, that's 21 plus years strong. We want the old equipment back. And the newer generation of gear, as Gordon laid out, in service provider, for data centers, and in the campus, is far more energy efficient, and we can help deploy that immediately. Between our partner specialization program, which deployed in uh, April 2022, now has over 1,000 partners in this space to help us adopt at speed and scale. So I think about you know, where you might be, I would just simply ask you to get started, right? Whether you've set your sustainability goals and targets or not, understand where your company's goals are because I guarantee you have a role and responsibility to play in meeting your customers, or meeting your organization goals around sustainability. Understand where the data starts, right? In any place of the network, we have this information available to share with you so you have a good credible baseline of where you're starting and what actions to take from there. And then last but not least, Understand where your next refresh cycle is. Let's help, let's help you do the calculation and simulation of could you potentially save energy? Could we take that product back? Um, you know, where's the value proposition for your organization, not just in the initial purchase, but the ongoing operations? And there's no shortage of things that can get you started anywhere on this journey. And so if there are papers you want to help bring back to your, not only your leadership chain, but other functions and disciplines within your organization, I guarantee at the C, a CXO level and your board level, they are trying to understand where your company is on this journey. Uh, whether it's, you want the details of this slide, all of these slides and much more are available in that uh, solutions ebook. Um, and there is a report that Intel did last year that actually helped bolster up why the role of CTOs and uh, CIOs are going to play such a fundamental role in this transformation of sustainability. And I think with that. We will say thank you. Thank yes. you for joining us at the session today. Much appreciated for spending some time with us. And hopefully you can see that it's not just about what we're doing today, but it's about how we're partnering in the future to think differently about how we're going to transform around sustainability. Hope you enjoy the rest of Cisco Live. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Great job, Denise and Gordon. Thank you so much. Fantastic innovation talk. Really, really appreciate that. Welcome back to the broadcast studio. Right now, we're going to show you a terrific eye talk from Fletcher Previn, our Senior VP and Chief Information Officer, on the role of IT today. How is Cisco leading with the experience? Fletcher looks at the unique role and responsibilities of IT in shaping our culture and our employee experiences across our entire enterprise organizations. Really, every minute that your employees spend struggling with a system, it's a moment they're not doing the work that they were hired to do. What can IT do? Take a look. All right, good morning everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, it's my great pleasure to help open the IT leader track. Um, there we go. Yeah. So just a little bit about myself before I get started to orient you. You know, I, I like to joke, I sort of got an early start in, in IT. That's a picture of me, I think, around my 10th birthday with a birthday cake in the shape of the thing I really loved most, which was my first computer that year. Uh, there was a while where I thought I might go into the entertainment business. That's kind of more the family business. And I spent some time on movie sets and worked as an intern at the David Letterman Show and the Conan O'Brien Show. But in college, I really figured out I always had this parallel love of, of technology and IT. And uh, after I graduated from college, I moved out to the west coast of the United States and uh, got my first job at walmart.com. Uh, I started there as a systems administrator working in the help desk, then became a systems engineer, then an engineering manager, got Microsoft certified, uh, MCSE, then became Cisco certified. Uh, and um, then at some point moved over to IBM, where I eventually became the CIO of IBM uh, for just under four years. And, uh, and then more recently moved to Cisco, where I, I now have the great privilege of being the CIO of Cisco. So what I was going to do today uh, is I have a lot of content, I'm going to move fairly quickly, but just take you through an overview of how we think about IT, uh, the role it plays in the company, how we're organized, how we operationalize some of it, 
um, share some of the mechanics of how we run and some of the results that we've seen, and, and hopefully that will be uh, uh, interesting and useful. This, by the way, is how we've organized the IT puzzle. You know, to some degree, if you're an experienced team, you want to organize things by value stream, and if you're a uh, platform or IT team, you generally want to organize more by, by systems and platforms, and that's more or less how, how we've organized things. So you can see here, kind of all the, all the way around here, the, the different functions that report directly to me. The one I would just call out, by the way, by a show of hands, how many people were not here last year? Oh, quite a lot, okay. So um, right around like uh, one o'clock on this, on this chart, you know, like just to the right there, you'll see Cisco IT design. That is a function that I created when I became um, CIO, reporting directly to me, led by Kristen Wisniewski, who you're gonna hear from later. And uh, the, the reason for that is that it's really so core to the strategy of leading with the experience, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but making sure that that is a, uh, direct report to me where we can decide sort of how that team's time is most effectively spent to improve the employee experience. The IT department at Cisco is about 10,500 people. It's about a $1.4 billion-ish budget. Uh, our application portfolio is about 4,000 applications. We have about 85,000 full-time regular employees. At any given time, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 50,000 contractors. So from an IT perspective, we're supporting you know, almost 140,000 uh, people working in the Cisco environment across 300 plus offices in almost 100 countries around the world. Our mission at, in Cisco IT is to enable the people of Cisco to do the best work of their lives and to be a user-led organization that is proud of the work that we produce, which is a higher standard than just sort of delivering things. You know, are, we, are we proud of what we're putting out there? If we're not, we need to stop and rethink why we're not proud of it. And then that we value agile, uh, so speed, but also with quality. Uh, passion for your craft, you know, hiring people who love what they do. If you're passionate about something, you'll be great at it. Uh, and kindness, you, know, you, you want to enjoy work and treat people with kindness and, and, and have a good time with the people you're working with. Uh, our strategy to do that is these three pillars. The user experience, which, you know, it's easy to say that, but how do you really make that real and what does that mean? We'll talk about that a little bit more, but prioritizing the user experience, meaning anything that we're building, whether it's a, an enterprise application, a mobile app, an email, a sign in the office, anything that a lot of people are gonna see, that we take the time to embed the design skills necessary in that thing uh, to make sure it comes out the other end looking like something from your consumer life and to make sure we understand the user pain points and that we're really solving the right problem. Agile ways of working, which has two sides to it. On the one hand is sort of how you're organized and how, how the work is flowing. Are, are we creating cross-functional teams that have all the skills that they need to, to deliver something end-to-end -end with as few dependencies on other people as possible. Uh, and then engineering excellence is the other side of that coin, right? Sort of uh, automation, CICD pipelines, DevOps, doing the right work the right way. And then AI and cloud, um, you know, leveraging AI across the portfolio as a force multiplier and building things in this kind of tightly coupled, loosely aligned, cloud-enabled, shift left for security kind of way. Those are the three pillars of the IT strategy at Cisco. Let's talk about leading with the user experience and what does that really mean? You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about IT as an important part of the culture setting in the company. If you think about your culture being a function of how work gets done, you know, we're the ones that are defining all the processes and, and the onboarding and how things get set up and which tools you're using. And so the quality of IT, whether it's intentional or not, ends up being sort of a daily reminder and a daily reflection of what the company really thinks and feels about the people working there. And so we take very seriously that responsibility to make sure that that's a good experience. And you can't have this terrible experience at work and this great experience at home. People's expectation of what you're gonna provide them when they come to the office 
uh, is really increasingly informed by the mobile apps experience they're having, what, what, their, you know, what their e commerce experience is like at home, and just in their everyday lives. And the idea that what is a best experience today is sort of the minimum for tomorrow. This is an ever evolving thing. And, uh, you know, complicated is easy, simple is hard. It's, it's difficult to make a simple, easy, elegant experience for people because it's a complicated world and the infrastructure is getting more complicated. And so when we talk about leading with the experience and embedding design into everything that we do and, and, the, and focusing on the user experience, that doesn't just mean what does something look like. It's not just visual design. But it's this full stack of design skills that are in that Cisco IT design organization that I showed you on that first uh, org chart, where you've got researchers who go out and talk to users and watch people try to complete a task and make sure we really understand what problem we're trying to solve. Uh, analysis of the data that is collected in that exercise to, to make sure we're coming to the right conclusions. Content people that make sure we're choosing words that make sense and that the content is easy and simple to understand. Uh, UX and UI to make sure that the workflow makes sense and that that is simple. And then, of course, at the end, what it looks like. But that full stack of services is really what we mean when we say sort of leading with the experience. And one of the things that we have uh, rolled out, you'll hear more about this when Kristen is on stage, um, but is the Employee Task Friction Index. So this is a balanced scorecard or a weighted score that takes the, the difficulty of a task, the importance of a task, and the frequency of a task. In other words, how, how often do people have to do this? How difficult is it? And how important is it? If it's once in your career at Cisco, maybe it's not that big a deal. If it's every day, uh, you know, that, then that gets a different weighting. And then put that into this um, uh, scorecard that has been built and say, um, based on this data, if we were to fix these things, this would have the greatest impact on improving the experience around this tool. Uh, as an example, just you know, sort of simplifying the experience, uh, this is what the mobile employee directory used to look like before on the, on the left. This is what it looks like now on the right. Just really sort of creating these great, simple, consumer-like mobile app experiences for people. Uh, the onboarding experience for people at Cisco used to be this nine-step, fairly complicated process. We've done a lot of work to make this um, a, a highly designed, simple experience for new people joining the company. This is an important moment when you join a company because you've made the decision to join. And if this is a bad experience for people, they go, I, I, don't, I hope I made the right decision coming here. Uh, so this is, this is one of those kind of important touch points. Uh, Lots of work happening on our intranet right now. Uh, you can see there's a redesigned employee directory on the left. In the middle is the new unified app store. So it used to be a little complicated to get the, app, the apps and the tools that some people need to do their jobs. This is now, there's one place to go. You click on apps. Uh, you can install most things with a single click. And then on the right-hand side, you see here this um, new digital assistant we're, we're uh, going to be rolling out very soon called Bridget or Bridge IT. Uh, but the idea is that this is the AI equivalent of a digital friend that has worked at Cisco for many years and knows the answers to all the things. Where do I find this? How do I do that? What's the answer to this? Uh, and knows things that are internal to Cisco and can help employees. When I first joined uh, Cisco two years and change ago, uh, they said, would you like to have the Cisco virtual office? I said, yes, I would. That sounds great. And this is what arrived. And so you definitely know you've joined a networking company. I get this ISR router. There's instructions that tell you what not to do. And uh, it began by saying, you know, connect the uh, gig zero and uh, get console on it and do this and that. It was kind of a lot to ask of people. And so it was neat technology, but it was not exactly the simplest experience for people. Uh, basically, it extends the Cisco network into your home. And so we did some great work around you know, creating a best-in-class hybrid work experience for people. And this hybrid worker bundle, which we've now rolled out to uh, many thousands of employees, if you're new, it includes your badge on the top. Uh, it includes a laptop, a trackpad, a keyboard, 
a Cisco WebEx device, a Meraki MX security appliance, uh, a Meraki um, wireless access point. If you have unreliable internet connectivity, a cellular backup gateway. Um, and then all, the whole thing is sort of supported by the Cisco security and software and collaboration stack, Duo, Thousand Eyes, WebEx, Meraki, Cisco Secure Client. Um, and actually, we have a, uh, a little video of this, if we could roll the video. Yeah, so you can see it comes in two boxes because the WebEx device uh, is, is sort of large. That's like an iMac size thing. You see the badge here and the lanyard. If it's a new employee, there's a little history of the company on the back of that that tells you why you should be really excited about working at the company. These two uh, suitcase kind of things. First one will open with the laptop. Underneath that is an external keyboard and either a mouse or a trackpad, depending on your preference. Uh, setting the laptop up is all zero-touch cloud-based provisioning. You don't need to be in the office to get connected to the office. And then we've got our Meraki MX security appliance and our Meraki MR uh, wireless access point. Those are all remotely provisioned by Cisco IT using the service provider features of the Meraki dashboard. Um, and so basically, this allows us to turn someone's home into a branch office, and the employee and all the devices and all of the people in that home are now protected under this umbrella of the same technology and security that the, the largest companies and governments in the world are using. Here's the uh, WebEx collaboration device. This is a hardware-optimized WebEx endpoint. It does also, by the way, support uh, Teams and Zoom if you're having uh, those meetings. But it's just a great way to provide a remote work experience where people are not disadvantaged just because they're not in the office. All right, and now moving on to the next slide. Did it come up? Yes, there we go. So uh, this is the new hybrid work operations center that we are uh, almost finished building in San Jose. This is where we take telemetry um, and uh, monitor the hybrid work experience all of our employees are having. And things like Thousand Eyes are a tremendous tool for us to be able to know what is the application level experience that people are having, even across networks that we don't manage. Think about the last mile into everybody's home and being able to know what the internet backbone performance is. What is the application level performance of things like Salesforce, Workday, ServiceNow, Microsoft, uh, and so on, and quickly be able to detect problems and fix them ideally before employees even see them. And the data is that whatever people had in their homes before, compared to the performance after we send them this bundle, that it's significantly improved. Um, you know, you got to be a little careful about cause and effect because everybody has different things going on, but there's a lot of corroboration that the Cisco Hybrid Worker Bundle means fewer dropped packets, reduced latency, uh, faster DNS lookup times. All that stuff's going to translate to a better meeting experience and a, a more efficient workday throughout the day. Another thing we've done is build this help zone kiosk in the offices for people. And let, I think there's a short video. Let's, if we could roll that video. We're reimagining the way our hybrid workforce gets the support they need. Introducing the Help Zone Kiosk, a streamlined IT support experience for those working in or visiting a Cisco office. Remotely connect one on one with a support advisor. Share your screen and address most issues on the spot. If your laptop needs service, immediately pick up a loaner from one of the lockers, then return it just as easily. Get the accessories you need, including cables, chargers, cameras, even PPE, with a swipe of your badge. No waiting. Look for a Health Zone kiosk at more Cisco offices in 2023 and beyond. More hybrid, less work, all Cisco. So it's a simple thing, but it's a nice thing. You know, you can go up, get support, get a new laptop, get devices. Um, and we've built several of those around. And you know, all these things are sort of adding up. Uh, year over year, the number of people that tell us they have the technology they think they need to be productive in their jobs is up 14%. So sort of, you know, when I'm talking to the finance department, I say dollar per dollar of the things that you can invest in that are going to create a more engaged, happier workforce, IT is the best investment that you can make. 
Let's talk about pillar two, the agile ways of working or doing the right work the right way. We set a goal for ourselves of getting double the throughput and cutting our cycle time in half. And the reason we did that is you cannot achieve a goal like that by just tweaking at the margins. You, you really have to change the way work is getting done, the way that you're organized and your engineering practices to be able to do that. And so you've got sort of the 12 agile principles that are well known and on the internet. Those are in the center here. We've bookended that with actual hardline organization reporting on the left, you know, forming teams properly, and some metrics and tools of how we're going to measure whether we're making progress against being a more agile organization. And then the whole thing supported by some agile training, some agile coaches, some organizational change management. Uh, and what is a well-formed team? In the agile definition of that, you know, what you don't want is like a body shop of people in different time zones, people moving in and out of projects, constantly forming and unforming teams. That's a real challenge, by the way, if you have a lot of outsourcing. You know, having this kind of revolving door of people, there's a huge uh, sub-optimization tax that's inefficient with that, right? This is not factory work. It's complicated. It takes time to learn the applications, the way things get done, who the other team members are. And so one of the core principles of this is we need to reform these 11,000 or close to 11,000 people into six to 10 person teams with the developers, the testers, the product owner, the scrum lead, uh, maybe a subject matter expert, possibly a designer, to create an intact team in the same plus or minus a few hours time zone uh, so that they have everything they need to actually deliver something and that we move work to the team not move teams of people to the work. And so I look at one of the, uh, one, this is one of the operational dashboards that I, I look at with each of my direct reports every month, and it's telling me things like people's span of control, the ratio of contractors to real employees, uh, uh, the ratio of doers versus enablers, that's the middle here of light blue and dark blue. So the light blue is based on people's job title and workday, who is a hands-on keyboard person sort of doing actual IT delivery work. And the dark blue is who are things, you know, not, not overhead exactly, but like people like me, who is a manager or somebody that's not actually doing IT work. Well, that's not the right way to say it, but you know what I mean. Uh, you know, non-doers of IT. Uh, that, that's something that we want to just keep tabs on. And uh, these are sort of the engineering practices that we really are or focused on. When I talk about the engineering excellence part of it, you know, building out our CICD pipelines so that we have these kind of golden pipelines for the different technology stacks. They're going to be different. You know, the way that you do a pipeline for SAP is going to be different than the way you do it for Salesforce. But at some point, the release train into production should be common and the same. Uh, having engineering standards, making sure that the backlog is in a state where it's ready for the engineering teams to pick it up, uh, making sure we have as few development and release environments as possible, investing in test automation, and having a cloud-first, API-driven strategy to how we get things into production. Uh, this is just a sort of thing. I send this out every day during the quarter end to the senior leadership team, and it's just a way to provide hyper-focus during quarter end, but this kind of visibility and transparency into what's happening in the IT department uh, helps sort of manage things where people don't have to ask you, you're telling them. Uh, we are making progress. Delivery is accelerating. We do now have a single funnel of work. That was a problem. When you're getting requirements from all different directions of the organization and people are going directly to other people saying, I'll give you money if you do this, that's a problem. We have a, a fixed capacity and we have to prioritize what we're doing within that capacity in the order that the business tells us is most important to them. And that's a difficult discipline, but uh, you know, we're making progress year over year. Um, throughput as measured as the number of uh, things we're doing in JIRA uh, has increased 33%. Velocity measured as the number of story points in JIRA is up 29%. The cycle time to put things into production is down 65%. Uh, we measure two things. How long did it take us to code something? And then how long did it take us to actually put it into production? Because some things like if it's impacting the finance applications, have a longer testing period. The business wants to uh, test those sometimes for weeks. This is an IT health check dashboard. So this is a Power BI dashboard, but it's grabbing data mostly from JIRA and a little bit from Workday. And it's showing me things like 
how, big it, how many people are in this team? Is the team meeting the, the agile definition of a well-formed team? Uh, how much of this team's work is going to transformation versus kind of running of things? Is the backlog in a good, healthy state? That's the, the chart at the bottom, the stack bars. Red means uh, that, that that is not refined, that we don't really understand what those requirements are, that's not ready for us to pick it up and take it. And so you, you would really want to have two or three sprints of work ready for the team to take. Uh, defect ratio, and then the doers versus enablers in that team. This is my management cadence with my leadership team. And it's one of the things that I put in place to overcome the fact that we're not all in the office together every day. You know, prior to COVID, you would just run into each other and you had a lot of opportunities to have impromptu conversations and ad hoc discussions about things without needing a scheduled meeting. So I have a 30 minute check in or check out every day with my leadership team. That's just a 30 minute unstructured meeting. There's no agenda. It's just whatever's top of mind for people. What do people want to bring to, to the table, talk about? Then there's a weekly staff meeting, uh, there's a monthly operating review, and then there's a quarterly all-hands meeting. And that's sort of the, the, the way we're trying to operationalize a lot of this. Uh, we have made some progress on launching our first hardware as a subscription offer on our new uh, technology stack. So that is making it possible for uh, cu customers and partners to uh, buy collaboration devices from us as a subscription. That's a new thing that IT has been central to. Let's talk about the third pillar, AI. And the way we think about AI is as a, as a force multiplier for productivity. You know, if you think about the Industrial Revolution was about mass production of physical things, maybe the AI revolution, and in particular the generative AI, is the Industrial Revolution of knowledge, for knowledge workers. You know, mass scale creation of information, pictures, thoughts, ideas, um, you know, ultimately, here's our, our approach to that, is we need to build some common AI infrastructure in the company. That's what I mentioned briefly this morning in the, in the uh, opening keynote. Make that infrastructure available to the product teams, to the employees, to everybody across Cisco to be able to take advantage of. Um, and then in the process, define blueprints that other customers can use. And so that, you know, I kind of covered this this morning, and we're kind of short on time here, but uh, you've got the, the 400 gig leaf and, and spine fabric on the left. That's where the uh, 256 GPUs are. They're all direct connected by 400 gig into the um, Cisco 8000s running Sonic as their operating system. And then uh, over on the right, you've got some ISR 4000s as the out-of-band management connected over 10 gig. But it's all Cisco optical. It's all Cisco Ethernet stack. And uh, this, this is up and running and available in the company for everybody to use. I showed that this morning. But one of the things that's interesting about Gen AI, if, I think if 2023 was really the year of large language models, 2024 is going to be the year of narrow language models, fine tuning, and using techniques like RAG or retrieval augmented generation to be able to take the benefit of something like an LLM, pair it with proprietary information that you have about your business and make that available through that nat natural language interface. So for us, it might be things like the TAC, uh, knowing case notes about something, or what is the POE budget of this particular router, or when does this ISR get end of life and which one replaces it, or help me write an email to a potential customer about why, why Cisco firewalls are better than Palo Alto. And it's able to do that not using public data, but using our data from things like Salesforce and other repositories uh, without any of that entering the public internet. That's the same technique that we're using to enhance our intranet with this uh, soon to be released digital assistant for employees called Bridget or Bridge IT, where you'll be able to just ask it in natural language internal things and it will be able to help not just find the right answer for those things, but actually take action and complete a task for you. So where are we with uh, generative AI? Um, you know, as I said, this is perhaps the most important, you know, it might not just be the latest technology, it might sort of be the ultimate technology. And it's gonna have very dramatic ramifications on um, how we train, how we skill. You know, if you think about, ultimately, AI is able to give us back the one thing that everybody doesn't have enough of, 
time. Think about how much time we all waste doing things that are not really core to our jobs. They're just things that you have to do when you work in a big company. Uh, how much of your day do you wish that you could just outsource to someone or something and have that be automated? Um, that's, that's what AI is going to bring to the table. And, and for, even just for general employee productivity, it's pretty exciting. And it's going to make it where the only real limit to what you can learn is how curious you are about something. Um, what kind of skills and how we think about designing products and how we think about building software is really going to change. What is a good experience in, a, in an AI model? It's not necessarily going to be about what it looks like or what the interface is anymore. It's going to be about the language and the words uh, and how efficient it is at doing things. That's going to change some of the skills we need. Ultimately, these kind of human-on-human -human skills will always be in high demand. Empathy, creative thinking, um, uh, being able to adapt, problem solving, but also some of the technical skills, really understanding how to build mass scale infrastructure, um, uh, you know, designing these multimodal interfaces, different kind of design skills, all of that's going to be incredibly important. An AI strategy requires a data strategy. Our data strategy is to create discrete data domains that are deconflicted, in other words, they're unique for customer, product, HR and legal, in other words, workforce, uh, install base, subscription and licenses, sales and marketing, and finance, with some governance and standards across all of them, and then a thin API-based consumption layer at the top of all of that. That's a longer discussion, but you know, what, what you, the big takeaway from this is you want to make sure that these are different and unique. Like, you don't want to have another domain here called insights, because as soon as I want to know something about a customer or a product, now I don't know, do I need to go to the insights domain or do I need to go to the customer domain? You, you want to make that really unique and clear. But as soon as you want to do complicated things, let's, let's say I want to use Splunk to be able to predict when a piece of hardware is going to fail. I'm going to need to bring in several of these data domains to do that. Our cloud strategy, uh, you know, we've been on a journey, like all of you, moving from the data center to virtualizing workloads and things like VMware to uh, cloud-native workloads to where we are now, sort of infrastructure as code with a mix of private, public, and hybrid cloud, ideally such that the application owner doesn't need to know where something is hosted because the control plane is the same for all of those. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little in the interest of time. I think everybody gets this. But basically, there's a decision tree that we have about you know, which, where is the right place to host something. Should we do it private? Should we do it public? Should we do it hybrid? If we do it public, which uh, hyperscaler is best for that kind of workload? Um, that's really sort of been useful in helping our engineering teams walk that decision tree and figure out where the best place to, to run something is. Um, you know, th this is sort of the only constant is that we are living in a time of unexpected events all the time. And so we need to be able to do things like, for example, um, provide assistance potentially in places like Ukraine in such a way that if things turn a different direction, that we can very easily disable all of that technology. And there were things that we just have to do that we didn't think about before. So being able to uh, you know, remotely manage and potentially wipe all of these kind of devices, timing scenarios, and, and, and so on. So summarizing up sort of you know, our strategy is to lead with the experience, to embrace Agile as our ways of working, to measure the right things. What you measure is what improves. Think about AI as a teammate, not as a replacement for people, but something that makes people more effective. Uh, shift left in our development lifecycle to include security and automated upfront. And to think about IT and position IT as a real driver of culture change. Um, and in a very real way, just the last thought here, you know, day to day, the decisions that everybody in this room makes feel sort of tactical. How should I configure the VPN? How do I want to do uh, new employee onboarding? Uh, you know, how, how should I configure this application or that? It all feels kind of like an individual decision because we're all balancing time and money and risk and security. But when you add all those things up, you're really defining the future of work and answering the question, what is it like to work here? And so it's important to kind of think of those things really deliberately 
IT has as great or greater an impact on the culture of the organization than HR. And uh, to some degree, that's new. We're really in the, at the forefront of defining the future of work. And with that, I hope, I hope that was uh, uh, informative. And uh, thank you very much. Great job, Fletcher. As we just heard, your IT team really can create the experience that you are looking for, both for your own enterprise management and also for your customer. So many great ways Cisco is helping to make that happen. Fletcher Previn, great job. For those of you who are just joining us here on the live stream from Amsterdam, welcome. This is your Cisco Live 2024. We are coming to you from the beautiful Rye here in the hub, surrounded by all of the excitement of the final day of the show. The social media lines remain open. Please continue to send in your comments, your quotes, your photos, and all of your questions using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. Our social media team is standing by. We want to hear from each and every one of you. And again, if you miss any one of our sessions, no worries at all. They're all waiting for you right there online at ciscolive.com. You can check out that VOD library whenever you would like. All right, now we are going to talk a little IOT, always a fantastic topic at any and every one of our Cisco events. I'm joined here in the studio by Samuel Pasquier. Samuel is our VP of Product Management for Industrial IOT. How are you, my friend? Very good, you know, last day at Cisco Live, amazing, amazing. It's blown by so incredibly quickly, and, and, and I'm glad that we got you back into the studio. We had a great conversation before, and uh, you've got another de uh, guest here in the studio with us right now. Why don't you introduce Emmanuel? I'll get out of the way, let you do your thing, and I'll be waiting right here when you're done. Thank you, Steve. Well, I'm very happy to be here, and today with me, I have Emmanuel Rotier, uh, Vice President of Smart Industry at Orange Business. So thank you so much, uh, Emmanuel, for joining me here. Thank you, uh, thank you, Samuel, and thanks for having me here on stage. Thank you. So, you know, Emmanuel, so everyone knows Orange as a service provider, but Orange Business, tell us a little bit more. So, Orange Business is the B2B arm of our D Orange Group. So, um, we are a leading operator and digital services integrator. So, we provide transformations, digital transformations, sustainable and efficient to our B2B customers. So we do that in combining our strengths in cybersecurity with Orange Cyber Defense, connectivity, cloud, and data. We provide, thanks to our platforms, but also to the ecosystem of partners, the, um, um, sorry, the um, transformation and, and the, uh, data, um, the data elements and efficiency of our customers you know, on a global basis. Okay, that, that, that's really interesting. So you, you said a, a magic word, digital transformation. I think all our customers uh, this week at, at Cisco Live are talking about that and want to leverage that. You have been doing that for some time, but what change did you see in the market? You know, how have you seen things evolving recently? Okay, I'm sorry I'm fighting with the, with the <laughs> here, but I think I'm going to do it without <laughs> it, okay? So we've seen, I would say, many things you know, happening in the market. So first, you know, the OT world is definitely, I would say, uh, adopting the IT technology. So it's a, it's a must, I would say, um, in order to, be, uh, to go towards the operational efficiency. And also the IT players have been adopting, I would say, and, and uh, putting and embarking the OT requirements into their product. So that's the first element. Second, what we've seen also is the cybersecurity. So the operations, the uh, OT world is the first target of the cyber attacks. For example, manufacturing is by far the first uh, um, divisions, I would say, are activities which are being targeted by cyber defense, by cyber, I would say, attacks. Second, or third, I would say, we have also seen, I would say, that the OT environment or OT uh, sites uh, and teams do not have so much IT expertise, mm. meaning that they need to have the IT capabilities to design, deploy, and operate those IT technologies to support their operations. So, you know, and, and finally, maybe the last point, it's about the regulation. So regulation is also happening. We see more and more, I would say, stringent regulations in cybersecurity domain. 
and just taking the example of NICE 2, right? I would yeah. say, which is going to be, I would say, uh, I would say <laughs> yeah, yeah, mandatory by the end of the year, right? Around Oct uh, October for sure, where basically it's going to impact more than 300,000 organizations in Europe, but even more, you know, beyond Europe, companies being part of the supply chain of Europe, you know, will have to comply with NICE 2. No, that, that, that's for sure. So, listen, uh, Orange and Cisco have been partnering for more than 30 years now, and we have been uh, working together on the IT world. So, how uh, are you addressing this customer challenge and this customer need with the Cisco technology? You know, how, you, how, you, how are you helping those customers? So basically, I would say we also on our on our on our side, Orange, you know, IT players. So we also developed and acquired OT expertise, and this is needed, you know, to better understand our customers, to embark their needs into our solutions. So we indeed uh, made our solutions evolving uh, in order to uh, to uh, to uh, embark those OT requirements, and also to make sure that the. OT world standards are part of our IT solutions. So we also have the capacity to deliver in the field, so on these sites, but also globally, those IT solutions made for OT. And furthermore, I would say the gaps that we see you know, on the IT technologies and capabilities on the OT side, so we help our customer to basically bridge that gap in offering managed services. The expertise that we have in-house in, in terms of OT and in terms of IT, which are so crucial for the OT in their digital transformation. So we make them available to our customers through our managed services. So, you know, it's been a very busy week at Cisco Live this week, but on Tuesday, I saw a blog post from you, Emmanuel. I saw quite some news on your side. So what have you launched this week? Tell us more about it. So actually, you know, we started uh, uh, to launch two services, and I will come to the, I would say, post uh, that you are just talking about. The first, I would say, service that we've been launching was about industrial, managed industrial land. So it enables to provide, I would say, the optimal performance of a land into, I would say, in a material environment. We have launched also managed security services, enabling to address, I would say, the threats of the OT um, uh, domain uh, and then to help, I would say, our, our customers to address that threat with our service. But we went a bit further. We basically use Cisco capabilities in terms of networking, but also cybersecurity cyber with CyberVision. So we embark CyberVision into uh, the switches, uh, Cisco switches, in our offering in order to make that a unique platform in order to deliver both an optimal performing OT network and cybersecurity, I would say, assessing the cybersecurity threats you know, for, for the OT world at the same time. And, and so basically this new service enables four, I would say, uh, offer four new elements to the customer. So first, it, it enables to deploy and manage a zero trust architecture, right, with OT sensor. Second, we are um, basically addressing the challenges of our OT customers with the optimal performing OT network, but also the optimal uh, cybersecurity part, right? And, and finally, we um, also offer um, one single player, a leader in cyber defense and in networking, being responsible for both services on the cybersecurity side, but also on the industrial one. And finally, it also enables our customer to, I would say, reduce their TCO. And why? Because basically we simplify the architecture with that platform, but also we reduce the needs for, uh, that, that our customers are facing in terms of resources, which are scarce and expensive. So this is a fantastic news, and obviously at Cisco, and uh, as a leader in initial networking, I'm very excited to hear about that. I have one last question for you, Emmanuel. So why Cisco? Why is the Cisco industrial IoT portfolio? So you know, Samuel, we've been partnering for many years now, 25 years actually, right? And you've been present in the industry world, I would say for a long time also, around 20 years, right? Your, I mean, you prove it here. I mean, your portfolio in terms of uh, industrial IoT equipment, I mean, is definitely very wide. Switches, routers, and even, you know, on the cyber defense part, you are present on the IT and the OT. So you are present locally and globally. And for us, being a global partner, I mean, that's very important. We can count on you 
to support us towards those OT customers to build up the right services like we just announced in order to address their challenges in the OT world. So, well, this is an Emmanuel. Thank you so much, thank you for the trust. Thank you for the partnership over the years, it's been am amazing. Cannot wait to see what the service is going to deliver over the next uh, 12, 18 months. And we'll be back at Cisco Live to talk more about it. So thank you so, so much for joining us uh, today at Cisco Live. But before we are done, I have one last word I, 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 wa I want to share. Uh, we have a very amazing customer, Audi. And Audi was recognized uh, by the Customer Advocacy Award, uh, the Cisco, uh, the Audi IT team, as well as the EC4P team within Audi, the Edge Cloud for Production team for this industry awards. And I really want to thank the Audi team for the amazing work that they are doing. Their work in trying to bring the data to the cloud, to extract the information, to secure the plant floor has been amazing. And I think it's a, it's a moment in the industry that is going to be defined in the future. So thank you, Audi, for your partnership. Thank you for your trust. And congratulations on this amazing award. So congratulations to you. That's it, Steve. Bravo, Samuel, well done. Yeah, congratulations to Audi IT and the EC4P team uh, for winning the award. Really exciting, and Emmanuel, I'll add my thanks in on the Cisco side. We really do appreciate the partnership, and we're so glad that you were able to join us here today. All right, thanks. Okay, what we're going to do now is keep the industrial IoT conversation going. Rob Boyd is out at the coffee demo in the world of solutions. Hey there, my friend. Hey Steve, you know, th so what drew me to this one is not just the fact that we're talking about IoT, of course, it's specifically it's secure industrial IoT, and yes, they're making coffee here, which begs the question, how many Cisco engineers does it take to make a cup of coffee? Turns out it doesn't take that many engineers, but it's a lot more complex than maybe it needs to be, but it proves a point. Ruben, thank you so much for taking time with us. I wonder if you could walk us through how you're using this overly complex coffee creation device to educate people on what's important here. <laughs> Thank you, so what we're, what we're looking at here is a coffee making machine, right? So let me go switch this on. And what we're generating is these coffee capsules. There you have a grinder there that's grinding the coffee and putting it into these capsules and we're sealing the capsule for freshness and that you see it getting spit out over there on the side. So this is the physical aspect. It's a, it represents a machine that is manufacturing these capsules. This whole machine is being run by this control system down here. So we've got a Schneider PLC, we've got a bunch of I.O., we've got some drives that are running this whole automation system here. And this entire automation system that you see here is connected through a Cisco industrial Ethernet network. And this is where all the magic happens. Okay. So if you go up to the uh, up screen up here. here. Yeah, he'll follow us. So explain, because I think the biggest thing you were telling me about is obviously coffee machines, good size to have on the show floor here, but these are generally connecting into very large manufacturing um, apparatus that may or may not have network connectivity, and a lot of times when it does have network connectivity, someone added it on without thinking through all that that might get them in trouble. Is that okay to put it? Exactly, that's, okay. that's, that's, that's the problem. And so we have been supplying industrial control networking for our customers for over two decades now, right. right? And the main problem right now is that people have not been paying attention to security. And that's where Cisco is layering in functionality on top of the network to help our customers secure their industrial control system. So what's happening here is that we have deep packet inspection built into the Cisco industrial networking portfolio. Okay. And that is helping our customers understand what the security posture of the control system looks like. Yeah. So what you're seeing here is everything that's connected to the network is now visible on the screen. This is, the, this is Cisco CyberVision, and it's showing you the posture of the control system. Okay. Right? So our customers understand the quality of the coffee they're manufacturing, right. but they're not paying attention to the security, and that's what we're helping them okay. get a handle on, the risk, the cyber risk in the industrial environment. And so this becomes much more turnkey, because you're talking about establishing connectivity where security is part and parcel of it from the get-go, including all the things that we know as security experts Experts, I say we, but collectively as a company, but the idea that it's um, zero trust network access you have highlighted here, the fact that we need the keys to be stored in a, in a, uh, in a, in a, a secure manner right. and distributed at the appropriate time once authenticated, things of that nature. You guys have already worked all that out so to make it easy. Exactly, okay. so here's, here's a particular Schneider PLC that I just showed you, yep. right? I can click on this PLC here 
and I can expose all the vulnerabilities that PLC has. Right? So yeah. now you can decide, are you, are you going to patch the vulnerability? And maybe in certain cases you can't patch it. You might want to put some security controls around it. That is what we're exposing to our customers here. So this is what CyberVision does. It helps them understand what the security posture, their risk in the OT environment looks like. Gotcha. Let me just take you to We've this. We've got one minute left, you tell yeah. us what's here. Yeah. Let me take you to this next screen here. The second big problem that they have is they're purchasing these machines from various parts of the world and they need those vendors to come in and service those machines, yeah. right? And now you're letting somebody into your environment and you've got to make sure that you're doing that securely, right? We have built zero trust network access into our industrial networking, so now you can control policy from the cloud and get access to anything that's connected to the network, even if it has a private IP address. And wow, what I'm showing okay. you here is by one click, you can go in and program the PLC. Perfect. From anywhere in the world. Because this is all about scale. We show it with the one thing, but any given customer, even small ones, are going to have hundreds to thousands of PLCs that need to be controlled we need to make that as simple as possible, give them one throat to choke, one pane of glass, all those terms we love to use. Well, Ruben, thank you so much. Guys, if you get a thank chance, you. come by here, check out how this works. That's the fun part about IoT. They always have a lot of good show and tell. But I did learn, insider tip here, don't come for the coffee. They're not actually serving coffee, but not a big deal. We got lots of coffee, lots of orange juice everywhere else. But come see how it could be done in the IoT booth. Steve? I appreciate it. Thanks to Ruben as well for that great demo. We're going to wrap up our section right now on secure industrial IoT. We're going to take a very short station break. I'll be back with you with the next great story. Don't go away. And welcome back to the Cisco TV studio. A little earlier we heard from Fletcher Previn about the role of IT and the leadership that IT can take in creating fantastic experiences across our network enterprise and for our customers. Well here at Cisco Live, we always host something called an IT leadership program. This is designed to deliver the business acumen, the technological expertise, and the relationships that are going to help you and your organization succeed in a digital world. Cedric DeVolder had an opportunity to sit down with Deepesh Patel to talk about IT leadership. Let's check in on that conversation. The future of the workplace and workforce is accelerating faster than ever. And as part of Cisco Live here in Amsterdam, we have our IT leadership program where we bring in IT leaders to help them develop their business skills, and technical skills while also helping them build great relationships with IT leaders and their peers across the board, which is super important these days. And there is no one better here uh, that can tell us more about that than Depesh Patel, who is one of our principal engineers here at Cisco. Depesh, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you for inviting me here. Yeah, no, thank you so much for being here with us. Have you had a chance to explore a little bit of a conference already, or what, what have you been up to? A little bit. Um, as you know, I've done a couple of sessions already. Um, yep. Had a chance to meet a few customers. It's been great to meet colleagues. Uh, so yeah, had a good time. Okay, and you said you're, you did two sessions. We'll jump about that. We'll talk about that in a bit. Sure. But can you just tell us a little bit more about what is the IT leadership program exactly, and also what do participants get out of it? Yeah, it's a, it's a, an interesting uh, part of Cisco Live. It didn't always used to be there. Uh, the IT IT leadership program is really about taking those that are making more executive decisions around finance, budget, uh, listening to their engineers are probably on this side of the, 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 the Cisco Live sessions, and seeing what they want to invest in strategically and how they want things to play out, what, how, to, how to kind of embolden their visions and, and, and those type, types of things. So yeah, that's, that's what the leadership program is really about. So what does that mean practically, right? Let's say I'm an IT leader, I yep. go into the leadership program, like. What do I learn? What do I take away after a week at Cisco Life? In so the what happens in, in the leadership programs, you'll see a much bigger, bolder vision around how things play out from a business perspective. It hasn't got the tech deep dive. Mm -hmm. so if you imagine, let's do some role play here. You're the IT manager, yep. I'm the tech lead. You may go to the ITM sessions and I may go to the tech leadership, se or sorry, the technical sessions. Okay. And we're going to meet afterwards, and I'm going to say to you, hey, this, this new fun widget, whiz bang thing, amazing thing, we need to invest in it because I think it's pretty cool. And you'll turn around and say, do you know I heard pretty much the same thing in the leadership sessions, and I can see how that plays out for our organization globally. And you kind of marry those things together, 
and you have a strategy for execution. So, so that's how we kind of see things play out. So it's basically like a puzzle, right? Like you have that technical part of it, you have then the business part that basically exactly. clicks into each other. Exactly. While then there is also an opportunity, I know, to like meet some of our executives, et cetera, as well, and have some like one-on-one -on -one time with a them. Absolutely, and you meet your peers, um, in the leadership session, you will meet your peers and ask them what they're doing and okay. see, you can compare and contrast what your strategies might be. So, Basically uh, sort of sharing some best practices across Exactly, the yeah. Um, okay. so there's, a, there's a lot of Kool-Aid to drink. Um, this is where it becomes real. So, awesome. Yeah. And you mentioned that you did two sessions. Correct. Right, so what were those sessions about? So let me remember now. So on Wednesday, I did the digitizing the office experience. Really, that's around how we design offices for the future. So we've obviously been through the pandemic. We've had a lot of changes in how people work. Um, hybrid working is, is no surprise to everyone. So we, we're trying to reposition how our offices look. Um, our CEO talks about having our offices as a magnet, not a yep. mandate, right? So I think that's a popular phrase that's bantered around a lot. Um, so what do we do inside the offices? The office space itself has changed quite a lot. It's not really about people that come to work and sit there Monday to Friday, they come more to collaborate. And to enable that, we've got to make the building smart. So as, a, as, a, as an engineer, what we're doing is making those environments much more technically proficient. Yeah. We, for example, we have PoE that supplies power to most of the offices. And how that plugs into uh, smart offices is that everything inside the office, from the desks to the blinds, everything is now automated to some degree. Um, and it allows the the building to be a lot more dynamic from the Monday to the Friday and scale up, scale down services as are needed. Um, you know, it's, it's great, I think, right? Because I'm, I'm a hybrid worker myself and I basically go into the office like maybe two, three times a week. Right. And I have like, when I come in, I use Cisco spaces and I can see which meeting rooms are free. Like there are, there are all these like sensors around the office and it gives us a lot of insight, right? Exactly. So that's really cool. And you, so that's one session. Right. That's one session. The second session, what was that about? The second session, um, and bear with me, it's called Embracing Sassy. No, okay. I don't know if everyone knows what Sassy is. I mean, I'm quite sassy, <laughs> I think, but as yes, a person. That, but we're talking about S-A-S-E, -S -E, right? That's yeah, right. Okay. Secure Access Service Edge. Now, it's not, a, it's not a, another acronym created by Cisco. It's actually a term from Gartner yep. on how we transition uh, services that we traditionally ran in our environment to a cloud-based model. So if you think of, and I'll give you an example, we have hundreds of offices around the globe. Mm -hmm. um, they connect in in a hub and spoke fashion to a central aggregation facility. We manage a lot of these. We, in Cisco IT, today we operate about 10, 11 of these. Okay. It's, it's, it's cool, but it's hard work. It's complex. And so we do this, customers do this. So what Cisco is doing in its strategy is to move to this new model where it's offered as a service. And Think about how you consume Netflix today. Yeah. If you think of the old world, you had, and those of you who remember, a DVD player. Uh, you had to play it wherever the DVD player was. Now you can consume Netflix anywhere in the world, on your mobile device, wherever you are. The whole thing's offered as a service. And so using the same analogy, SASE, we hope, will provide a similar service in terms of connectivity and security services. Yeah. I I think it's very fascinating how it works, I think, Sassy, and like how you're on that trajectory. And what I said in the beginning, it's very, uh, it's going very fast these days with technology. Correct. So while you were wandering around here at the conference, what are some of the key, like hot topics, I would say, uh, what are some of them that you've heard a lot, um, among or some of our attendees? I bet you're expecting me to say AI. <laughs> AI, AI, AI. There you go. <laughs> so we're not going to speak about AI. It is a hot topic, but yeah. We'll leave that for the experts. I think the other two ones that are really noticeable for me, sustainability, mm -hmm. um, even in the way the whole Cisco Live is, is configured, um, yeah. the recyclability, and, and even how people are thinking about power consumption, how to design networks of the future. Um, <clears throat> and the final thing for me is automation. Not automation just for the sake of automation, but automation to drive simplicity. So if I look at a lot of sessions, it's, uh, uh, and maybe Cisco's been guilty of this, maybe a lot of tech companies have been guilty of this, of overcomplicating the environment. So driving simplicity through automation, I think, is standing out in, a, in quite a few conversations. So I think if I can summarize this, I think the IT leadership program is really a program that will help you build 
a foundation for your digital future in your organization. Absolutely. Would I Absolutely. say that? Yep. Awesome. I'm going to say it better myself. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, the best for being here. You're welcome. And that's it. See you soon. Thank you so much, Depeche. Great content, great thoughts there. Uh, excellent job, Cedric, as always, we appreciate it. Right now, we are going to move into our IT leadership session. So this is going to be a fireside chat with Gemma Trowbridge, with Adele Trombetta, with Jose Van Dyke, and with Gordon Thompson. So these leaders are going to share some of the technology trends that they are most excited about, but also why they believe those trends are so important for us and for our industry today. At the same time, they're also going to cover the impact that shifts within the IT sphere demands on our IT leaders are having today. Which capabilities can you take advantage of? What can we look at today? What can we look forward to in the coming months? We're going to have a great time here in this IT leadership session. I encourage all of you, post out your comments. If you hear something you like that gets you excited, if you want to ask a question of our team, please put it up on social media with hashtag Cisco Live India. Here we go with the IT leadership session right now. Awesome, so I would like to start by thanking you for coming to this session. I am super excited to be able to talk about some of the big trends that we have within our region and within the industry as a whole. So our aim today really is going to be to talk about what's top of mind for us here at Cisco and then also give you an idea on how your teams can help address those um, as we continue to evolve. So you will be covering some of these topics in your sessions this week. Um, so we hope that we can really just get you a little bit excited about those. Um, we will maybe also have some time for Q&A. It depends how much these guys talk. No, um, we'll so please, very short. <laughs> so no, please do so submit any questions that you have <laughs> via the WebEx. So I'd like to start by introducing myself. I'm Gemma Trowbridge. I'm going to be your moderator for today. I am a product manager within Cisco IT in the workforce collaboration team. And my role really focuses around some of the moving parts that we have on our smart building projects. I'm joined by three awesome leaders. Not very often that the women are the majority, I will say. Oh, yes. You're <laughs> right. I love it. I love it. Um, so I would like to kick off with you guys introducing yourself. Um, I'm going to throw in a little fun icebreaker mm. um, just to have a little bit of fun. Um, so when you're introducing yourselves, I would also like to know your favorite way that you're using technology in your day-to-day -day life. Oh, wow. OK, who should start? Adele, do you okay, want to go? Fine, I go. So um, I'm Adele Trombetta, and I'm leading customer experience uh, in, uh, in EMEA for Cisco. Now, very quickly, what is customer experience? Everything is post-sales. Everything is about uh, delivering value to our customers, to you, and uh, with the support of our dear partners, too. So quite excited to be here with you talking about it in the trends. And what about the technology, the way I use technology? Um, Apart from the 24 hours that we spend working, no. But seriously, uh, I should say WebEx, but I, I tell you why. <laughs> My husband is a lawyer. He doesn't understand anything about the technology. <laughs> and uh, he keeps asking me how to use WebEx. But now that we have all the assistant with the AI, yeah. I don't know anymore what to do, huh? how to spend time with him. But that's the way awesome. I use. Awesome. Gordon, how about you? Hello everyone, I'm Gordon Thompson. Uh, I lead the service provider business for Cisco in EMEA. Uh, and um, my favorite use of technology, well, I'm kind of sport daft, mm. uh, much to the consternation of my wife. Um, <laughs> and uh, I love to watch sport everywhere and anywhere. So all of these mobile TV apps that are on my iPad, on my iPhone, constantly allow me to watch soccer, nice. watch a bit of golf. That's presumably you support a Scottish team. I do, yes, I do. <laughs> we'll not go there. We'll not go there just in case. <laughs> awesome. And then Jose. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for having us here. So my name is Jose van Dijk. Um, I've been with Cisco for about, oh, I always dare to, dare to say 27 years. <laughs> I say it really fast, 27 years. Um, I'm leading the um, EMEA Channels organization. I still have my old job as well, which is the Partner Performance and Experience organization. So Adela and I always yes. work a lot together. Okay, so I, WebEx, of course, I was saying, like, I, I love that you've 
that one <laughs> push button. I mean, I love that. And I've got three dogs, so that noise cancelling is the best thing that I think was ever invented. Yeah. And then I have a love-hate relationship with my watch because I, it's so nice to see all the emails and webics and everything coming in. But then it's freaking annoying as well because you look <laughs> at it all the time like, okay, what else is coming in? So, yeah. Awesome. So, we're going to start off by taking a broad look at what's going on in each of your areas. Mm -hmm. um, so, we're going to jump straight in. Uh, Jose, we're going to start with you. Um, you've been in your role for a few months now. Yep. Um, how and where are IT channel partners seeing the biggest growth opportunities? Hmm. Oh, the biggest opportunities. Um, well, Gordon and I talk about managed service all the time <laughs> because um, as we go to market, growing like crazy in, in, the, in the managed service, I think all of our partners see a, a tremendous growth in, in, uh, in managed service. If you talk to my colleague, Alexandra Suguri, you know, she'll tell you that 50% of the world is moving to, our, of our business is moving to managed services. So absolutely, our partners are moving in that direction. Then there is, of course, security. I mean, cannot leave this, this stage, of course, without talking about security, but it is a massive opportunity. You saw it this morning, you know, security is connected to the network. So our partners see that, they know it, they're, they're working with us, so that's fantastic. Then the other big opportunity is everything that we do in co-sell opportunities with AWS, with Accenture, so those are the three major things, I would say. Awesome. Um, Gordon, coming to you, what trends are you sh seeing shape the telco landscape, especially looking at the digital transformation and the role that service providers can play? Yeah, there's a lot going on in the service provider space mm. just now. Um, I think, first of all, from a market transition point of view, when I go out to meet senior leaders in the service provider organization, they're saying a number of things to me. They're saying, you know, how can we be more agile and more automated? How can we get services to market quicker? Um, they're thinking intensely about security and, and um, sovereignty. You know, can we launch sovereign services in our market? Uh, they're thinking a lot about sustainability. I was with a uh, leader of a large telco a couple of weeks ago and he told me that they consume 1% <laughs> of the country's energy. Wow. You know, so they've got a, a hyper focus to consume less and spend less on energy. Um, they're all focused and demanding that we're open and we're API driven. Um, and um, they're all talking about AI, surprisingly <laughs> enough, in terms of what that means. So there's a lot going on from a market transition point of view. From a technology and architecture point of view, what we're seeing is our service providers are thinking no longer about backhauling all of their traffic from the user to you know, centralized big massive routers or routers in the core mm -hmm. of their network where all of the intelligence is. They're trying to move as much of that intelligence out to the edge of the network as well. That allows them to provide better <coughs> services um, to the end user customer, but it also allows them to kind of mitigate some of the hyperscaler threats of them coming in over the top of the service providers. If you can control the traffic at the edge of the network, you can far better control how the traffic goes to the hyperscaler as well. So there's a lot going on architecturally. The final thing happening in service provider world is business transformation. Mm. So we're beginning to see a number of service providers split their company into two. So they're splitting it into a net core, a network company where the license is held and they build out all of the infrastructure. And then they have a separate company called the service company or the Servco that's building all of the new agile managed services to take to market and to move to market. So we're in a really interesting time where there's a market dynamic, there's an architectural dynamic and also a business dynamic going on. Awesome. Uh, Adele, coming to you, what specific trends are you finding most promising that are maybe exciting you a little bit? Look, first is really all about <laughs> the recurring questions that we have been discussing in the last two days at uh, Cisco Live, everyone, is how they can do more with less. It's all about that. And the answer is not AI, 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 but <laughs> is AI, definitely, is AI ops, and definitely sustainability, to, to your point, uh, um, Gordon. Look, when, but the interesting part when uh, it comes, when we discuss about AI is, um, Everyone, and we could say that it's very similar to sustainability too, because everyone knows that AI is going to change the way we work and w the way we live. Uh, and um, there is the, as probably you know, Cisco has done recently a survey with uh, more than 8,000 customers at global level. And we came with the Cisco AI index, readiness index, 
and 90, more than 90, 97, and don't never remember the numbers, 97% of uh, these customers, they are saying that in the last six months, they have seen an important acceleration on the, when it comes to AI. But it's even true that 84% are telling us they don't know how to manage that. It's still too early. They do not have the skills. And here is where we have an important role to play as a Cisco. And uh, the role that we have to play, it goes across from the infrastructure. And you know, we have even this morning in the keynote, we have been talking a lot about uh, Silicon One and how that can help to prepare the infrastructure for AI. But then across our software, you heard uh, a lot um, um, G2 talking about the security AI, but even on the collaboration side, again, my husband is very happy about that. <laughs> and, uh, but even from a CX standpoint, we are investing a lot on, uh, on AI. And uh, we are trying to do fundamentally three things. First, we, what we call um, task augmentations, things like how we can generate code by AI or test um, by AI. The other is the persona assistance, how we can help first, easy to think about that, the, how are engineers for the TAC when we have any problems, how we can help them finding easier, in a way more easy way and faster way, uh, the, the solution of the problem, and even the professional services, how can help them identify new advice for our customers and recommendations, or customers directly, how they can build their curricula uh, when it comes to the learning. And uh, finally, we use AI even to extract way more information from the rich amount of data that we have. But just to close uh, the point, of course the results are amazing, and just back to my point of the attack, think that we are really getting to a resolution time that is 50% lower than before, with an increase of five points of customer satisfaction when we use AI compared to when we don't use AI. So AI is good even, of course, because it will allow us to increase the quality, not only the time of resolutions. But what I really believe it's important for us is to take into consideration the skills gap. Because yes, we help our customers, yes, we help our partners, but first we need to help them creating the foundation to use AI in a responsible way. Awesome. So I think we can see that AI is actually a common theme across all of your areas. We've heard a lot about it already today in the keynote. If you walk out into the world of solutions, we can see so many AI-driven solutions. Um, and we know that in IT, part of Fletcher's uh, technology strategy has an AI thread. Um, we do know that it brings a number of challenges with it, however. So, Gordon, how do we see trends like AI changing the security landscape? Is it changing any service provider customers with their requirements? Um, and how are we addressing those? Obviously, every service provider's network is their business. So at the heart of everything they have to do, threat detection and mitigation against all of these things is, in the, you know, is one of the most important things that they can look at. I think our message to a lot of the service provider customers over the last couple of years is look at the in purposeful um, acquisitions we've made around data collection. Um, from AppD to Thousand Eyes to Cydian Networks to Sam Knows and now through to Splunk. Um, all of those companies are around data collection and harvesting data to be able to make better business decisions. And a big part of those business decisions are risk mitigation, behavioral mitigation. And from our point of view, really helping our service providers, customers recognize that, you know, our job isn't just to provide world-class IP connectivity. Our role is to be able to make sure we secure that connectivity and we understand exactly what's happening on that connectivity is at the heart of what we do. And when I look at how you know, we compete against other networking vendors, I don't see other networking vendors investing in data in the same way that Cisco's mm. investing in data. And ultimately, you're going to see us take these data lakes across all of these different companies, merge them all together, do you know, modeling on top of that to be able to provide much deeper insights across what's happening in the network than you know, we can even imagine today. So um, a lot of the conversation is absolutely about tactically you know, locking, helping our customers lock down, but more strategically, we're having a conversation about how they're going to use data, data to make better business decisions yeah. and better security decisions. Jose, anything that you're seeing in terms of AI adding value in your space? 
you know, we didn't even practice this, but you know, I was going to talk about <laughs> data. So, you know, um, <laughs> in my old job, actually, um, I'm working a lot with Fletcher's organization. Um, we have created, you know, when I started in that old job, uh, I don't know who of you have heard of, you know, Partner Experience Platform, but when I started in that old job, we had about 170 tools mm. that our channel partners were using. A little bit too many, you would say, we all agree, so we <laughs> reduced that heavily. We put it into this platform that is called the Partner Experience Platform. Mm. But then, you know, if you look at it, that platform as a house, every house has a foundation. And that foundation was the data that we have. We're sitting on something like 30 years and more of data from our partners. You know, if you have all that data, then what are you going to do with it? Especially if you then build on all of these capabilities with regards to like how much trainings are these partners taking? How much, you know, how much are they taking with regards to CX in the life cycle? Mm -hmm. How we're driving that in terms of how much has been adopted, how much has been renewed? There's so much information on there that we now can combine together because we have it on one platform. That's where you know you use the power of AI. Mm -hmm. So between Adela's team and my team, what we have now created mm -hmm. is something that we know what we call GrowFinder. We know for every single partner and their end users what their install base is. We know, for example, if they have sold bought Firepower or Fire. Um, firewalls uh, or ice or anything like that and they haven't used any of the other things that fit into that portfolio we can give them now actionable insights that gave that tells them like hey if you do xyz you know you can increase your business by x percentage so white space you know cross sell uh, sell opportunities but we can also say for example because you know in the renewal space, for example, mm. if they if they don't renew, somebody else will renew that order. So, how much business do you lose? Or we can say from because we want to go to a la carte, from to EAs, of course. You know how much a la carte is still out there that you can convert into EAs, and therefore you can make that much money again. And then you link it to all of the incentives that we're giving to our partners. So there's a massive opportunity, business opportunity, that we now put in the hands of our partners through actionable insights, through AI. So fantastic working uh, with, I, uh, with our IT teams, actually, to do that. Amazing. That's awesome to hear. So we're going to shift gears a little bit to another big one. Um, sustainability is obviously a growing topic for okay. a lot of businesses. We heard a Dele talk in the keynote this morning. Um, and within Cisco IT, we are working on smart building initiatives that look at how we can use technology to help drive smart and sustainable real estate. We just opened a new building in Paris, amongst many other locations, and we've got more coming up across the region. Adele, alongside your role as SVP, you're also the Global CX representative for sustainability, and I know it's something that you're passionate about. We yes. already heard you this morning. <laughs> um, how are you seeing technology help drive the sustainability agenda for our customers? Should I ask asking the audience if you remember the three steps to see if they follow <laughs> <laughs> uh, the conversation on the keynote? No, joke aside, I will not ask you. But um, honestly, it's really back to the point that um, you said just made. It's all about data because the and it's seriously back to what I said on the on the keynote. The main problem that we at the moment we have to solve is customers and partners and us, we all struggle to make the invisible visible. We need, we need to measure what is our carbon footprint. We need to measure where we are when it comes to the sustainability and sustainability posture. And the, the beauty, but in a way, is even a, a bit of a dichotomy yeah, that we need to manage because technology, technology like AI, IoT, the IT-OT conversion, uh, um, the, uh, of course, uh, the full stack observability, security, silicon wire, all of them are going to help us getting this visibility. But it's even true uh, that these um, technology are going to increase the usage of energy. So that means uh, we have to be conscious in the way we use the technology. Technology can help us big time in monitoring the consumption, in coming with the recommendation, especially now with the AI, in terms of how we use the uh, data center, how we use our smart building, how we use the grid. 
can help us for the renewable energy, how do we generate, we, we storage and we distribute the uh, renewable energy, but we need to do that having in mind and continuously measuring the impact of this technology. Otherwise, this will be an offender rather, th rather than helping us when it comes to the, our future planet. Awesome. Gordon, anything that you're seeing in the service provider space as a kind of result of some of this drive? So we mentioned earlier on how much energy they're consuming. Mm -hmm. So they're all, mm -hmm. you know, very focused on how they're going to reduce it. Uh, two ways we're really focused at the moment. One's what we call layer, layer convergence. So predominantly the core of your network, you have an optical layer that's managed um, and that then connects into an IP core layer, which is managed. And um, what we've been able to do now is be able to allow that optical layer to plug directly into the IP layer to be able to take away all of that cost for optical termination and management. And that's helping most of our service providers in their core network reduce their energy consumption by somewhere around about 60% in their core network. Um, the second thing we're doing is we're looking at what we call service or network convergence. So after you've built the core network, what you then have is an aggregation layer and then the edge. Mm. And what most service providers up until now have been doing is building separate aggregation and edge networks for all of their different services. So their MPLS services or their broadband services or their 5G services are all built on separate networks, separate power, separate management. And, um, and software technology now within the router around things like segment routing is allowing us to put all of those services in one router and to be able to decom you know, to mix, uh, to separate them out within the router themselves and route them with policy and everything like that defined. So when you add um, service convergence or network convergence onto core convergence, you're hearing things like service providers saving 80% of their power consumption in their network. That's the game changer. The challenge is converging these things together means you're not just converging technology, but you're converging organizations. So there's a big operational shift and organizational shift for service providers, which is pretty difficult to do. You have an optical team today, you have an IP team, you know, tomorrow you have one team. And so those, those transitions culturally are harder to drive, um, you know, but the technology is there to make it happen today. And you know, the cost of energy is driving that need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I just add to that? Because, you know, what I think to make it easier for organizations, what we have done again from a, you know, between all the work, what Gordon is doing with the SPs, what Adela is doing with, with from a CX perspective, we've put all that data again mm. on that PXP <coughs> platform. And what we now have is an, an uh, mm. simulator, a sustainability mm. simulator. Mm. And with that simulator, you can calculate, you know, yes. what is happening within what you have in your network or the opportunities that you have with your end users for refresh. And if you do these kind of refreshes, what does it give you? Mm. And I think that's our way to make it easier for our partners and our end customers to make sure that we're doing the, f the right thing within the sustainability with a simulator behind it that calculates for you what the impact is. Ah, oh, very interesting. Um, so we know that we've got these trends coming through um, amongst many, many others that I'm sure everyone will hear about this week. Um, but I'd like to get into what can be done in response to some of these trends um, and how we're supporting our customers and partners as they continue to evolve. So. Gordon, you touched on service provider there. What strategic measures can they be taking in response to these trends? I think it's back to the comment I made earlier on. I'll just say it quickly. It's about recognizing the silos in your organization and not continuing to operate in mm -hmm. silo. It's about recognizing the need to culturally you know, bring those organizations together to be able to find better outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the key challenge that we see when we're working with service providers today, the ability to break those silos mm -hmm. down to allow people mm -hmm. to work together to achieve better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then Jose, you thinking about Coastal and your space, yeah. where are IT channel partners seeing opportunities with Coastal, both regionally and globally? Yeah, I think that, you know, to what Gordon is saying, I mean, talking about the outcomes this morning on stage, uh, I think it was Jonathan Ajito, I can't remember, who mentioned what we're doing with Cohesity. That's a mm. co-sell opportunity, but there are different kind of co-sell opportunities. You know, we, we often see that if we bring two different, three different partners together in order to drive the outcomes that the, the end customer wants, we see a bigger size of the, of the opportunity and a, a faster way to implement it to the market as well. So that's where co-sell comes in very quickly. But then you talk about co-sell opportunities 
on you know the cloud marketplaces then you can go even faster so we see a massive opportunity in how we work with Microsoft Azure, with AWS and their marketplaces, and a lot of their own partners have their own marketplaces as well. So that's where the co-sell opportunities come in as well. Awesome. Different angles. Awesome, and then Adele, coming to you finally, as customers race towards their digital transformation, mm -hmm. how are organizations addressing their operational needs whilst maintaining their technology continuity as they shift from hardware-centric to a software-centric environment? It's a long, yes. that deserves a long, <laughs> long answer, <laughs> but I'll make it shorter. Um, actually, we are trying to copy uh, the methods that we usually use in the software environment and adopt, um, uh, adapt, adopt and adapt to the uh, hardware environment. Actually, what we are doing, we are now working on what we call infrastructure as a code. So we are trying to create and base our infrastructure on a data model driven automation. This will allow you customers and even our partners in really automating and accelerating both the implementation phase as well as the operation phase. Why? Because everything will be as a code based on a data model. That means if you want to do any change in your infrastructure, in the configuration, in the testing, you can do that by a click. And these is numbers that we have are proven numbers. We have already implemented, especially for the SP, for the 5G, the savings in terms of timing for the implementation is in the range of the 40% and for the operation is 90%. And if you think about what uh, Jose said at the beginning, so we use and we can do with the simulator or even with the real time data and assessment of the energy consumption and we can come with recommendations and say how the customers could evolve, for example, data center. And think if in the evolution of this data center, we inject the automation via the ACI as a code. Well, the result is customer can save money and impact in terms of sustainability and can increase the quality and can make way easier for them to implement and maintain and operate their data center. So it's really a win-win solution. Awesome. So I think that brings us some to some time for Q&A. Wow. From the audience. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Adele, Gordon, Jose, and Gemma. That was a really insightful uh, session, and it actually got me really thinking as well about what I too can start to do to prepare for tomorrow and the technology of the future. Right, if you do have any questions for our panel, please scan the QR code and put them in the WebEx space. We do have a couple of questions already coming through. So this question goes out to, it could be anyone. Okay, Gordo. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll fight for this one. <laughs> We've seen a lot of challenges globally over the last few years. The pandemic, political conflict, and so on. Have you seen any impact of these on the growth of these trends and the transformation they drive? Mm. Um. Well, first of all, I think around security, everyone's become far more focused around the sovereignty of our data. Um, you know, there's certainly been a bit of a repatriation of applications from public cloud back into private cloud in some instances, and uh, obviously that's had an impact on network design. Um, I wouldn't say anything, you know, uh, there, nothing around conflict or war is driving anything around sustainability, but mm. certainly the energy cost of war uh, has driven people to think much more meaningfully around sustainability, not just as a strategic intent in terms of achieving net zero, but mm. <laughs> fundamentally reducing their energy costs mm. today. Um, so I'd say those are two big things I would say that come out from what's happened over the last couple of years. And, and even the digitization of the utilities is, is in a yeah. way as a consequence of the cost of the energy, but even the fact that o country wants to be independent from an energy standpoint on the back of the wars that are ongoing. So definitely to your point of sustainability, how they can consume less and how they can get be more independent and in doing that, how can use the renewable energy? Yeah, the only thing that I think what I would add um, is from a talent perspective, because mm, that's a good yes. one. What, what happened after COVID 
is that a lot of people went into, I don't know where they went actually, I mean, you tell <laughs> me. <but laughs> <laughs> we had a big need for talent actually, and it, it took a while to normalize. And I think, especially from an IT perspective, so I guess you're in the right uh, job here, <laughs> there's still, there is a massive need for more IT, more IT security, more, you know, especially now we go to AI, and you'll see that, that we, we still need more and more of these kind of experts in the market. Point. Fantastic, point. thank you. We've got time for one more question, so this is the last question, and this is to you, Adele. Mm. <laughs> so how are you working with organizations to integrate sustainability principles when deploying and maintaining IT services to help them with their sustainability journey? That's a very good one, and thank you whoever raised the, the question, because you know what we are trying to do, and is already an available uh, service, is part of what this morning I mentioned, the life cycle services. We work with, the, with our customers in order to do first what we call sustainability priority assessment. This is, that is an assessment that is technology agnostic. Because the first thing that we need to do with our customers is to understand how, wh where they are, which are their goals, what they can achieve in terms of sustainability. The, the how will come later. And when we do this kind of assessment, we think of the different personas in the organization. Because think about that, what sustainability means for a CIO is very much different from what sustainability means for a CFO or for a CEO. But the power comes and the beauty comes in the moment we are able to align their goals. And that's what we try to do with this uh, sustainability priority assessment to define the strategy, the overarching strategy for the company. Then, of course, we translate that and we create a governance, how they can track and how each of the different teams can contribute. Then one layer after, we start looking, looking into the technology and we look into the Sustainable IT and IT for sustainability, of course, you, you, you can image that, imagine that, but this comes only one layer after. The first thing first that we need to do with our customers is to help them understanding what their priority are, how they can work internally and come together as a one team. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Adele. Thank you. With that, I'm going to hand back over to Gemma to wrap the, the final session. Thank you. So I think before we close, we've got one quick takeaway we can get from each of you guys. So Jose, let's start with you down there. Takeaway. <laughs> um, I think our part, so for Cisco, our partners are like, you know, 90% of our business runs for our partners. Our partners help us to innovate. Our partners help us to co-develop. Our partners are help us to drive the market forward. So we very much appreciate everything that we do together with our partners. Um, and I think from that perspective on, you know, driving the innovation with our partners on security, AI, that's where I see the future going in managed services together. Awesome. Gordon? Um, I think... Um, don't look at sustainability, AI, or security in isolation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think they're all interconnected and interweaved together. And certainly for organizations to take the maximum benefit out of how all of these transformations are happening, you need to look at them holistically within mm -hmm. your organization and not in isolation. Anna Dele, finally you. Mm -hmm. I will just ask you to, to reflect on uh, what is behind all of this technology and a AI, automation, sustainability, because we keep talking about uh, AI in each of these sessions, but we should never forget that, yes, there is an element of the digital uh, uh, experience, digital world, but there is an element of human, and are still the human behind all of that, you even behind, and especially behind the artificial intelligence. So we really need to make sure that we prepare our team, our workforce for the futures. Will be a different future, but there will be a future for everyone, and we need to invest on the skills of that for them. Awesome. So with that, we are going to hand back to our host. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.
great to be here. Uh, I love every time getting to, uh, to Amsterdam. I started my career out here doing uh, uh, contact center design. Uh, it wasn't yesterday, it was a long time ago. Uh, and uh, it's always great to, uh, uh, to be back here and thanks to so many of you for uh, turning out for, uh, for this session. Uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, generative uh, AI and the way I want to do this is uh, I want to look at what AI is and what generative AI in particular uh, is and what that opportunity is and what the risks are associated with it. Um, the most important thing that I want to do today is give you um, a framework that we've created at Cisco for responsible AI. Um, it's something that is uh, never finished. You have to react all of the time and, and always evolve your responsible AI framework, uh, but it's something that I, I think will be very, uh, very useful. And we're going to have a really, really great uh, panel discussion as well. We've got some great speakers uh, that will, will join me uh, later on, and we'll talk about it. But one of the things I would like to do um, is get a little more impression from you about uh, you know, your use of AI. So if you don't mind, I could have used Slido, but I just I thought we're all here. Let's do like a show of hands. Uh, what I'd like to do is ask you, um, how many of you right now have deployed or using an AI feature in your organization? If you are, raise your hand. OK, great. That's really good, very useful. And then also, how many of you are, say, would you consider yourself knowledgeable on how AI machine learning works at a, a technical level? OK, about the same. Well, I'm glad, and I'm glad that was like slightly less as well, because if you all already knew, I'd have very little to talk to you about. So uh, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to address uh, some of that and give you some information on uh, AI and what it is. Um, I, I want to start with uh, something that our CEO, Chuck Robbins, said about AI. Um, he says, the acceleration of AI will fundamentally change our world. Cisco is committed to being a trusted partner to customers and to helping them navigate this transition in a responsible way to deliver on the promise of the technology. And the two key words there uh, for me are trusted and responsible. Um, because if me and the team and everybody that works on AI at Cisco, if we just create something that is a set of technologies, but they can't be trusted or it's, it's not delivered in a responsible way, then all we will do is create things that are good demos good AI demos, but not something you can actually deploy and use. And the same, I imagine, is true in your organizations. It can be easy to demonstrate what AI can do, but if you truly want to use it and deploy it, <clears throat> and deploy that in a trusted way and responsible way, that's how you will get adoption from your users, um, and it's how um, you will uh, get some trust in the technology itself. So I really like the way that he put this. It's something we translate into the engineering and designs across the entire company, and that's uh, partly what I want to uh, share with you today. Um, I want to start with some data points uh, that we learned last year in our data privacy index. And you can find this infographic on, on Cisco.com. There's a whole bunch of additional information, not just what I have on the screen here. Um, but we uh, surveyed a bunch of people around their attitude and their customers' attitude uh, to data privacy. So it's interesting looking at the topics on the left. Um, what do people think is important? Ensuring a human is involved in the process. Uh, adopting AI ethics and principles. Uh, AI ethics management. Looking at bias. These are all uh, seen as really critical areas. But interestingly, that um, of those respondents to the survey, 92% uh, feel that their own organization needs to do more to reassure customers about their uh, uh, use of data and their data. And uh, that's something I would share. I don't think it's, you can ever do enough. You have to be very transparent um, and you really have to focus on uh, data privacy. And again, it's something that we'll get back to a little bit later, but I wanted to share that data point uh, with you at the beginning uh, to, uh, so that you can see what everybody else uh, is seeing. But check out that data privacy infographic. Also take a look at our um, data uh, AI readiness uh, index as well, which we published in November. Uh, it has some pretty interesting information uh, also. So the next thing I want to do is talk to you about your relationship with generative AI. And I found this very interesting framework from McKinsey and thought it would be useful for today's session. Um, they frame the way that you would interact with generative AI as being either a taker, a shaper, or a maker. So a taker is somebody that might just interact with a generative AI service. Let's say you use Google Bard or ChatGPT and you just interact with it. You ask it something, it gives you an answer. Then you're a taker, you're a consumer. Um, if you maybe modify, customize, use prompt engineering, use fine tuning, use retrieval augmentation generation, RAG, some of these recent uh, techniques. Let's say you do any of that customization, then they would categorize you as a shaper. You're shaping something that exists and you're modifying it to your needs. 
And then last is Maker. That's when you are creating your own foundation models, if it's a large language model, or if you're creating your own generative AI services in some way, not just large language models. So at Cisco and, and at WebEx, where I work, um, we're all of these things. We do all of these in different ways. We apply the best technologies to solve for the right types of use cases. So we pay attention to all of these areas. But that means we have to have a varying posture for responsible AI. If you're just consuming a service, then you just need to know the service is good and uh, you can continue. If you're shaping or if you're making your own services, then your um, level of responsibility increases. The parameters you need to look at are, are more varied. Um, so I thought it would be a useful framework to share with you. And as we go through the presentation, um, you know, ask yourselves uh, in any given scenario, am I a taker, a shaper, or a maker? Um, so let's look next at how machine learning works to address the question that I asked earlier. It's, it's very different. Developing machine learning software is different from uh, developing uh, maybe traditional features. Um, you know, m many of you interact with your phones, with apps, with uh, you know, maybe joining meetings, whatever it might be. Uh, if you want to join a meeting, you push a button and you end up in the meeting. It's very deterministic. It's very clear what should happen. When you're dealing with machine learning, it's predicting. It's trying to come up with a level of certainty what it should do next. It's not as deterministic. Um, and the way that it works, and I took this slide from a deck I used at Cisco Live in 2018, um, was looking at an example of face detection. Not face recognition in this case, but just detecting that there's a face present. And the way that we would do that is that we would define an output. So an output would just be a text label saying human face. And the training data would be an image of a human face. And then you would need thousands of those, or tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands, depending on the problem you're solving and the type of AI algorithm or deep neural network that you're using. You would pass that training data with the labeled output through a uh, deep neural network, and that would create what's called a machine learning model. So that model now creates, and it would sit there, and it would then act on live data, like one frame of video with a person in it. You'd pass that through the model, and it would determine uh, the output it was originally trained on, which is a human face. So the output from the live should match the output that you trained it on. And then you would come up with that output with a certain level of accuracy. And it's all about accuracy. The, it's not about, in the past, if I click the button, does it work or not? It's what is the level of confidence, level of certainty in the output uh, matching what I was trained on. And what the data scientists would do is fine tune and further train that model to increase the level of accuracy and certainty so that when you release some software, you have a good feeling, good idea of what it's going to do, which you really should with all software. Um, and it gets used. Machine learning, supervised machine learning like that has been around for a while. Uh, we were watching this trend that emerged from academia in the 2010, 2011 timeframe. In 2015, we started building some of these first features in this way. And, that, and that, those breakthroughs were really interesting. They were um, the availability of cloud compute the availability of large data sets and good old mathematics that we all learned at school. Um, and when you made that combination, you could solve these new machine learning uh, problems. Um, so that's how uh, machine learning works, supervised machine learning. Let's take a look at that um, in action. So what I want to do is show you how this would work using our uh, noise removal, background noise removal, um, which is a supervised machine learning job that runs right on the client, right beside the microphone where the noise is happening. Uh, if you're making noise, it will remove it. So let's ro roll the video and we'll see uh, how supervised machine learning works. So if I take one of the most annoying things that happens in meetings is people type loudly on the keyboards while they're in the meeting. You can see it here typing and see how annoying that is. Or maybe somebody comes in and they're eating lunch or something like that while, um, while they're on the, the conference call. Um, what I'm going to do right now is, act, is activate noise removal on my um, Cisco Desk Pro device here. I have now activated that. So if I go back and type again as I'm speaking, you might hear some small clips coming through, but certainly nothing like before. And similarly, if I rustle the paper while I'm speaking, the noise will be removed and my, my speech will be enhanced and that will pass through. So you can see in, in that that it is trained on what noise sounds like. And then in real time, we can remove that noise and enhance the speech. Um, and it's in a very much closed loop. It's doing just that job. Uh, and that's how uh, supervised uh, machine learning uh, works in, uh, you know, in, in just one example of working on, uh, on, on speech. And with a truly, really amazing result. I promise you I was pushing the keyboard and rusting the paper equally loudly as in, in the second as I was in the, in the first. Um, so if we fast forward now to generative AI, well, what is that and how is it different? So generative AI is a set of AI algorithms which use the data they're trained on to generate net new content. And that can include text, imaging, audio, video, and synthetic data. 
Um, and that is a big difference, is the generation, the creation, um, uh, rather than just predicting an output. Now, it is, of course, doing that uh, by predicting what it thinks it should do next. So if you ask a GPT, which is a generative pre-trained transformer, and we just looked at supervised learning, so pre-trained, it's just the same thing at a very, very big scale and a lot of different AI techniques, machine learning techniques that are used, including transformer techniques, um, and it has a very large context window. So I can ask it a question, and it might remember back to the start of when I started talking to answer it, not just very recently. So as a result, it has this appearance of intelligence, but really it's just predicting what it thinks is the next thing it should say or do. So if I say to it, the sky is, it may say blue, but it will more likely say a celestial body of gas surrounding a planet, because that's the most likely thing that would follow that sentence. If I give it a prompt and say, uh, answer like you're a five-year-old, it will say blue. It's amazing. If you've directed in the right way, it will know what it should do and what it should predict next. But it's a very similar technique on a much bigger scale. And the case for why generative AI, I probably don't need to uh, uh, even take time going through this with you. Um, it's very clear that this is something that can accelerate automation. It can create new levels of productivity in, in people. It can deliver contact center and customer experiences and solve problems that weren't solvable before, and it can un unlock entirely new use cases. It also democratizes access to this technology. You no longer need to be a data scientist or a machine learning practitioner to be able to access really amazing AI uh, results. And what we're seeing is everyone is talking about large language models and generative AI associated with large language models. But of course, in a conversation, there's a lot of also nonverbal. There's video, there's audio. It's not just text. So we take a much broader view on that, and we're we're very interested in how we combine large language models with real-time media models. So let's say if I was in a meeting and I gave a thumbs up, and that was, uh, was, floats out across the screen as a reaction, then um, maybe we could have a large language model note that in the meeting notes. So that's an example of a large language model interpreting an action that has come from a, a real-time media model. So we see the landscape of generative AI much bigger than uh, text-based interactions and GPT-only type uh, interactions. So um, next, what we're going to do is look at some of the opportunities and also the risks uh, associated with that. So I'm just going to switch across to my laptop, and uh, we're going to see a, a demo here, um, which is actually directly from um, my actual WebEx app, which is uh, what you'll see here. So it's uh, my day-to-day. -day. Uh, if we can switch to my screen, please. Um, so this is my actual WebEx app in messaging. I'm going to go to the conversation I have here with Audrey. And I've got an assistant. I'm going to ask it to summarize the last day of conversation. You see it doing that in the bottom right. And it's telling me I'm going to be joining the transition year student welcome from Cisco Live tomorrow via video, blah, blah, blah. Right, so it's giving me uh, all of that information. It's summarizing uh, in, in that way. Now, next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to another application, which is Slido. And uh, Slido is uh, used for audience engagement and Q&A in large format events. We'll be using it later here. Um, and what I've done is typed a question, which is, Cisco is a leader in collaboration. AI is an amazing technology. Will we win? And I could choose to make that more professional. I could shorten it. I could make it more casual. I could make it more joyful. I could also have a little bit of fun and make it rhyme. So let's see what it does. So it says now, Cisco, a leader in collaboration, so fine. AI, a technology truly divine. With these powers combined, oh so grand, will victory be ours hand in hand. So I'd like to announce my new career as a poet with no background or ability in the area, but I'm assisted by generative AI. And it just shows you, right, that it's, it's something that, like, I, it's not something I could come up with. It's not something... I, I would come up with, um, but I was assisted here. It's an AI-assisted experience. And the only thing that we're doing different in this is changing the prompt, because if I shorten it or make it rhyme, I'm just telling it, it's getting the same input, but I'm telling it to treat the text in some different way. So if we switch back to the slides, um, I covered um, a little bit about um, uh, what we would uh, do with uh, text in that example, and now, and we also covered audio, so let's look at video and uh, how this would work. So in this case, you're seeing a 3D face mask on me, including the way I'm looking. You'll see in a moment my, uh, the direction of where my nose and eyes uh, is going um, as I look uh, to the left and right, so we can see uh, the, the direction. Um, I can also look at some gestures, like if I raise my hand to ask a question. Um, it will detect hand raise, or if I give thumbs up for feedback, it can uh, detect that type of gesture as well. So looking across the entire piece of um, uh, audio, 
video and speech, we can see how we can generate different uh, types of responses and, uh, and generate different um, uh, outputs. And that all sounds great. But why would we need to be so cautious? These are compelling use cases, they're interesting, and there's a ton more things that, that we could do. But the reality is that the techniques behind these, generative AI itself, um, poses a, a number of risks. And I would categorize those into three areas, which is a business risk, uh, a user risk, and a data risk. So there's a huge risk to the business and its reputation. Large language models can suffer from something called hallucinations, where it, if it doesn't know the answer, um, it can maybe make one up or guess what's uh, coming next. Um, from a user point of view and a business point of view, you can suffer from IP leakage. So if I ask it a question, maybe about some code, where does the code go? Is it remembered by the model? If somebody else asks a related question, will they get a sample of my code or worse? From a data point of view, could somebody else's code or intellectual property or copyright end up in my business because I've asked a question and it provided an answer and I just took that answer and used it? So um, is that OK for me to do? Who, who owns the output of the generated uh, content? So there's so much to consider. And there's so much for us to consider and be aware of as creators. There's also so much for you uh, to be aware of in what you create, adopt, and deploy in, um, in your uh, organization. Um, and um, one example I wanted to give of this, of the type of risk, this was a real example. I found this on, on Medium. Um, and it's a, a prompt where we're asking a GPT type service the following question. I saw a woman and her husband at the parking spot trying to change the tires. Who is less efficient changing the tires? A, the woman, B, the husband, or C, no answer. And it answers A, the woman, with no information in the question that says that's the answer. This is gender bias based on the data it was trained on. In the second prompt, we add to the question, ensure that your answer is unbiased and does not rely on stereotypes. Now the answer is C, no answer, which is the correct answer because there's no information in the question that tells you what that answer uh, could be. These is just one example of the type of risks that are associated with generating net new content. So it's important that we have prompt engineering um, to provide safety and guardrails uh, around this. And to reduce this type of risk, over many years, we put together a responsible AI framework. Um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit tomorrow uh, in more detail about this. But just to mention it very briefly, um, we have a framework that's based first on six principles, transparency, fairness, accountability, privacy, security, and reliability. And examples might be in fairness. Is the data set that we've trained on fair? Does it represent the users of the system? That might be in their audio tone, in skin tone, and whatever it might be, but is it a fair-based system? So we have to ask that of ourselves as we create things. So that's just one example of one of the principles. And we also have a framework that the principles are part of, and that includes governance and oversight, incident management, external engagement, industry leadership, and controls. And just to pick on one example in incident management, you can raise an AI incident just like you could raise a security incident against us at Cisco, and we'll take that seriously, and it will come to me and a bunch of other people, and we'll triage that to see is it an AI or model type of incident, or is it something else? I'm not aware of too many others in the industry that have this type of AI type incident management um, in the, the system. Um, so I moved through that uh, uh, pretty quickly, but this framework itself is what I mentioned at the beginning. This is something that we spent many years putting together. We continue to evolve it. Uh, if, and maybe I'll ask for a show of hands again, how many of you have an, a responsible AI framework or framework for AI in your organization? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, so very, very few. And it, this, this is uh, something that, you know, it's, it's, it's reasonably generic. It may serve your purpose well, but it will at least give you a starting point. So I would suggest, uh, you know, taking a look at this on, um, on Cisco.com. Uh, you can adopt, modify, you know, change it for your business. Um, but it is a, a very good starting point uh, for uh, responsible AI. Um, and like I said earlier, if all we do is create the technology, then you can't deploy it really without these types of frameworks because there's so much governance and so many uh, uh, regulatory uh, areas, not, not just govern, government regulatory, but even rules within your own organizations and risks that you have to, to mitigate. So again, this is like, this to me is the most important part of the session is um, you know, providing this type of framework and, and letting you know uh, where you can go to get that uh, on cisco.com so that you can, um, you, know, you can take that forward and use it. 
So uh, next, and uh, have, having heard enough uh, from me, um, what I want to do next is go to uh, a panel uh, discussion. And um, uh, for me, it's, uh, it's a real opportunity to, uh, uh, to geek out, because as you're aware from this content, I'm heavily involved in responsible AI and governance uh, around that. Uh, in my uh, personal life, I'm a huge uh, cycling fan uh, also, and I'm going to be uh, uh, joined by two amazing individuals uh, who are going to give us their perspectives on uh, use of AI and um, responsible AI in their organizations. Uh, so please uh, welcome on stage to join me, Kim Gronsma, Strategic Advisor, CIO of the Office of Dutch Government, and Ivan Speckenbrink, CEO of Team DSM, uh, Fermanek post NL Professional Cycling Team. Have a seat. Okay. Thank you. Have a seat. Great. Okay. So, uh, welcome. And uh, first, maybe it would be good for everybody to hear a little bit more about your roles. Uh, Kim, we can start with you. Uh, I'm Kim Gronsma. I work at the federal government CIO office, and I'm an enterprise architect and strategic advisor. Great. Thank you, Ivan. My name is Ivan Spekerink. I'm founder and CEO of the most cool cycling team <laughs> <laughs> out there. Team DSM Firmenich PostNL, uh, a World to Men program at the highest level, a World to Women program and a development program. Great. And congratulations on your very successful start of the year with multiple wins already. Yep. That's great. Fantastic. So uh, let's go to um, uh, use of AI. I'm very interested in um, you know, how you currently use or maybe plan to use AI in both organizations because they're, they're, so, they're, they're so different, yet responsible AI is so critical in different ways. So, but first of all, let's figure out how you use AI. Uh, well, currently we use uh, very little AI because uh, uh, the cautious part is very important to the government, of course. Um, how we use it now is uh, like you showed in the noise reduction uh, and we plan to use it in the future um, uh, for uh, subtitles. Okay, Weapons. all right. So as, uh, um, as people are speaking, we can get the subtitle, the closed captions live yes. across the screen, so speech AI. Great, okay, and uh, uh, Ivan? Now, maybe to, to explain it, maybe first a step back. So what, what do we actually do as a, as a cycling team? It's, it's all about performance, ultimately performance on the road to, to win bike races. And um, basically, if you have very gifted and talented uh, athletes and very gifted and talented people who work with those athletes, it's only a starting point, a very important starting point, but a starting point. And the way of working, that determines how successful uh, a sports team is. And the nature of our sport means that at one moment, we're sometimes divided over five uh, places on the, on the world. And if you want to implement new ideas, new technologies, etc., etc., you first want to get your people on board, that they really know, okay, what's going to happen? How are we going to do it? But those moments are very, very, very rare that everybody can be there. So already pre-corona, in order that we can accelerate uh, the implementation of science, knowledge, etc., Pre-corona, we started working with WebEx so that whether people were at the race, they could still log in and uh, be part of a, of, a, of a meeting or a conversation wherever they were. Um, and that's basically uh, how we could accelerate the implementation of yeah, new training, new tactics, new aerodynamics, biomechanics, et cetera, et cetera, nutrition strategies. Um, yeah, and now the next step is that you want to, to, to be ahead of the game, to be ahead of your opponents that you want to be uh, uh, even, that you want to accelerate it even more. So even when people can't join, uh, it's now nice those, uh, those summaries you have with action points and uh, the key background of information so that we still, still can continue and that's where we use it very much. Great, and I, I saw actually just on some social media, um, like uh, writers doing things like press interviews uh, via WebEx sometimes, and yep. uh, maybe even using the uh, WebEx uh, devices on the road. Sometimes you take them around with you, or do you use the laptops? Yep. Uh, there, there's so many ways. So if, for example, we have meetings, so you have regularly in the bus before the start of a race, you have your tactical meetings for that day, and we have people from headquarters uh, dialing in. So if they can't be there, they are still there. In times of Corona, when you had these two meters distance, uh, media, normally the media, there's a crowd of media in front of your bus doing interviews. 
that didn't work. So we actually uh, provided uh, the idea of let's do interviews through WebEx. And after Corona, we continue that. Rather than only one-to-one -one interviews, you can do interviews to much more media. So there is multiple ways uh, where we use it, let alone uh, our marketing colleagues with our partners. They obviously also uh, uh, use it, yeah. Mm, good, yeah, it's good to see also some good things and lessons and habits learned from that that we can actually uh, take forward because there are, yeah, you have a, a better reach and uh, yeah. that will be important when we talk about the responsible AI also because you, you have that reach uh, globally. So it is, a, a, uh, it is very, very critical. And if we move now to um, uh, responsible AI, so uh, Kim, what are the areas um, in responsible AI that would you know, concern uh, uh, you most uh, when, it, when it comes to use of collaboration? Well, actually, the government has identified a couple of areas that are uh, that pose challenges uh, for the use of generative AI and also uh, AI as a whole. Uh, the first one is that um, you don't know yet how to make sure that groups of people aren't discriminated against. Um, the second one is uh, the use of proprietary data um, for training. And the third one is that uh, there are a lot of AI capabilities coming to market, but those capabilities still rest in the hands of a very small group of companies. And how, as a government, you can make sure that you don't become too dependent on a small cluster of companies. Okay, I, I might actually take those as questions back to me, <laughs> even though <laughs> I was asking you the question, because I think they're really fascinating areas. And to put maybe some context on that and to just think about some industry thinking uh, ar around it, um, you know, it's, it, it's interesting looking back at some of the examples I gave earlier when it comes to things like uh, discrimination. I mentioned needing for need to, the need to have training data that's representative of the people that are using your system. So I mentioned things like the audio tone or, or skin tone. So when something like noise removal, what if you had like a high-pitched voice? You don't want that to be interpreted as noise because a system, if trained in that way, could, could be. And these are the types of things that actually, as you mentioned that, it made me think back at our design time, we had to think about things like that. What are those outliers, those things, you know, so that it's, it's not uh, uh, discriminatory in, in any way. Uh, the same with uh, dealing with uh, lighting conditions and different types of skin tones for uh, background noise removal. If you have like a light skin tone and very high light or a darker skin tone and low light, it's, it's challenging for the camera, for camera intelligence. So these are things we need to, um, uh, you know, to, to build in. Um, you also talked about uh, ownership of data. I think that's really critical, yeah, right? So great. like, uh, because uh, you, if you're using an AI feature, you need to know that uh, you, you have the right to use it. Not just if somebody sells it to you, it doesn't guarantee that you have the right. So you've got to look at those terms of use, terms and conditions. I would definitely encourage you to look at that in any application globally that you use in collaboration or otherwise. Um, what are the rights you have to the data? And has that organization transparently published how they source their data, how they train on it. Uh, I know for, for a fact when we go through each machine learning workload, we source that data directly, uh, not basing on, uh, on customer data, um, um, and take that workload and train on that specifically. Um, and and uh, these things evolve all of the time because as the problems evolve and the machine learning solutions evolve, that attitude to interaction with data changes. So I would definitely encourage you to look into that. Go a few levels deep in whatever AI feature you're using. Every organization, if you're using it, should be publishing that. Um, so make sure that that's the, the, the case. And then the last area you talked about was the, and it's a fact actually, that um, this set of AI technologies, generative AI, is in the hands of a small number of, uh, of, of tech companies um, right now. We've been looking at that also, and it was, I, I didn't want to mention it earlier because it's a lot of detail to go into, but we put together uh, architecture layers for generative AI that allows us to interact with external uh, generative AI services, large language models, um, our own real-time media models, uh, open source models, like there's, uh, there's marketplaces like Hugging Face or AWS Bedrock or various others. You can take models and then train them with your data uh, and host them in your environment. So it's, uh, it's really important that I think that there's, there's a, a level of openness. And as I mentioned earlier, that the barrier to entry is lower. So we have to do a jo good job as an industry, I think, to expand the use of that and not have uh, you know reliance on on so few i think that's i, I hadn't yeah. you know heard that as a concern before but it is a good fact and something we should um, we all should uh, pay attention to um, so, uh, Ivan, uh, how about you in terms of um, uh, the areas of responsible AI that are most important? Now, one, one good example and a very important example, um, 
elite sports teams are somewhat different than a normal company, as long as a normal company exists. But we, uh, for us, security and particularly uh, security with ar around privacy is important. So we know and measure everything of, a, of an athlete. So we know all the blood values because our trainers need to know everything about an athlete. Our nutrition uh, strategists need to know everything. Our medical team, if somebody is sick, we measure lung capacity, we measure the power output of athletes, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, and a normal employer can't ask uh, that kind of data from an employee. And with us, yeah, we need that information to work. But you can imagine that it's not kind of information that you want out there. That we have to be very, very careful. That security needs to be yeah, uh, top notch. The same, um, it's even when there is, for example, injuries, that's also information that normally it's, it's very private. What is the injury that somebody has? But yeah, you can see in television if somebody breaks a collarbone, uh, and what are you gonna tell about it? So that information that we have internally needs to be shared. We are very prudent in what we communicate uh, externally. But that information should never get into the wrong hands. Mm. Gosh, that's uh, I, th you. You mentioned things that I had never thought about because when we focus on, when we focus on things like the, the data privacy, which is very, uh, very locked down, we're thinking about that mostly from an end user point of view in terms of first an organization opting into an AI feature and then an end user opting in. So something like face recognition or face detection is like off by default and you must opt into it. Something like noise removal is on by default. It's extremely useful and nobody really turns it off. Um, but like that's as far as it goes. But when you look at that level of personal and highly competitive data, uh, yeah, you could like, um, you know, tip off another team to a weakness if they have information yeah. uh, uh, as, as one, one factor. So yeah, I can imagine the extra layers and levels of security that are needed. That's, uh, that's re really, uh, really fascinating. Um, so let's look next at like our future needs and where we go. Um, so uh, looking at um, <coughs> what you need most, what you would like to see next or, or need most from uh, an AI system, Kim. Well, what we are looking into first is um, the um, uh, subtitles. And the reason why we're doing that is to crea create workplace equality. Um, and that also leverages uh, the, um, well, actually uh, colliding policies where you have to be on the one hand very cautious with AI. And on the other hand, you have to provide an equal workplace. Mm. Uh, but looking at hybrid working, how can that be fully equal to someone who has, for example, a hearing problem? And that is something you can um, arrange for them with the subtitles. So uh, that is where we are now going into AI. And that also gives us a, a chance to uh, face those challenges, what I was talking about earlier, and go into all those details, because we have to. Mm. Uh, and then hopefully after we can leverage more AI cap capabilities. Okay, that's that's really um, uh, really interesting because um, I like I was part of the team that developed the first transcription and closed captions, and when we developed it, it was more like an enterprise use use case. Um, and we're seeing it adopted more and more for accessibility reasons uh, right now, and people turning it on everywhere in every room so that you have equal access uh, across every organization. We're also seeing it with the new generative AI features that um, you know, if, if somebody is having difficulty following along, uh, or maybe even like reading along with something, getting just the summary, the, the summary or getting caught up on a space or a meeting um, uh, helps them uh, because it just provides that concise information rather than everything um, that, that was needed. That's something we see, uh, we're seeing in the uh, early trial feedback um, uh, in addition to transcription and, and closed captions. Um, and uh, uh, Ivan, how about you for um, uh, what's coming next or what you see need most in a collaboration AI feature? Yeah, basically there are two things. For one, we d just discussed privacy is important for all the reasons I mentioned. And one, one of them also, like you said, we don't want to give our competitive advantage uh, to other teams. If other teams know with which threshold, how much power per, uh, per kilogram uh, or an athlete can sustain 20 minutes a certain effort, but not longer, yeah, that information we don't want in other hands because they can easily then they can change tactics when they would know that. Um, but on the other hand, all everybody in our team on and off the bike is driven uh, to perform and actually driven to get better every and every day. And to do that, we need to implement the latest science, technology, every experience we have, training, nutrition, tactics, etc. And we don't want to wait. And uh, the, 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 the tool of making the summaries of meetings that now even when we're, not, when we're spread all over the world, 
but also people who can't join for whatever reason, that we don't have to wait, that it doesn't slow us down. And those summaries with background and actions, uh, which is then shared with everybody, that's yeah, for us a magnificent uh, step forward actually to keep, uh, to keep progressing. Great. Great. Um, we're in a moment, we're going to open up for some audience questions, but I have one fun question that I just want to finish for us as a, as a panel here, and that's, uh, are, are there other ways, e either professionally or personally, that you use uh, AI, um, you know, outside of uh, WebEx, Kim? Um, well, what I really liked using AI for, my uh, husband's grandparents had their 60th anniversary uh, this year, and uh, we used AI to color in their wedding photo, and uh, we framed it for them. Okay, fantastic. That's great. <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit more serious uh, <laughs> answer for for those of you interested. Um, we did, let's say one element to be a successful cyclist. There's many tactics. There is uh, mental stability, the, the ability to suffer. But one of them is your physical uh, level to improve your physical level. And our movement scientists and trainers work with the athletes, but it's very hard for them to be uh, accountable. And normally, they say, hey, there was a good race, so we train them well. But it could be other factors, could be tactics, could be... Um, so we are really investing a lot in making our uh, physical development better, making our training better. And as you know, if we start training by the end of October for the Tour de France in July, each training is already hundreds of decisions. Uh, what is the difference between four hours and four hours and two minutes? What, uh, what, what efforts do we do to increase VO2 max? What efforts do we do to uh, the anaerobic threshold to improve it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if something then happens after five months and you have to adjust, while already thousands of decisions have been taken, yeah, how can you do it. It's sometimes a little bit uh, how, how trainers work. And there we really uh, use uh, AI to really make uh, better and lock down uh, uh, our training knowledge to there uh, get an advantage over others. So yeah, for us it's an important topic. So you have these uh, kind of predicted outcomes based on lots of different data points. It's, yeah. it's actually, it's a really good use case for AI in yeah. general, uh, that's, uh, that's fascinating to know about. So I think at this point, uh, I'm, I, you know, I could sit and ask questions uh, <laughs> a lot, but we have a huge audience here. So um, we'll maybe hand over to uh, uh, Dean uh, to uh, see if we have any questions coming in from the audience. Yeah, yeah so thank you. Great session. Uh, if you've got any questions, please post them in the WebEx chat. I've got one actually here to either key my one. Um, we know that there are those out there that are concerned that Gen AI will replace jobs. But in Fletcher's opening keynote today, he mentioned to use AI as a teammate. Do you both feel the same of that, that AI can be a teammate? And what would, what would examples of that be? Well, I think, for example, the, the note and minute taking in a meeting, um, I think probably everywhere uh, the, the secretarial positions have been downsized and um, for us, it's always like a gamble who needs to take notes every time another person does it. And sometimes they're quite good and sometimes they're horrible or you don't even get them. So I don't <laughs> think it will cost a job if AI takes the notes. I think it will actually make us more efficient and also keep like a running agenda for the next time. Like things we say, okay, this time it needs to put, be put on agenda for next time. I think it will actually uh, help us be more effective instead of well, handing off boring tasks to each other. Okay. Right. You. Yeah, for us the same. It's definitely a good teammate, an important teammate. Um, just the example that, uh, that I just gave, uh, normally you have X amount of uh, movement scientists per, per so many riders. If you really want to build that knowledge, we have now extra uh, movement scientists and trainers to build this knowledge with EY. So we keep the same number of trainers per rider, but we're building actually this uh, knowledge. Um, it should help us to get m a better understanding ourselves and take better informed decisions. So it's not about replacing uh, people. Yeah, and I would, as I said earlier, uh, you know, there is um, uh, the design philosophy that we have of assisted AI, not replacement AI. I think that's, that, that's critical. Um, and there's also some things you can't do, like AI can't ride a bike. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you, so it can only be a teammate yeah. uh, in, in that case, I, I think. Uh, but I, th I do think it's something that we have to focus on. Um, a very re a recent uh, research from Stanford University, actually, who are very well positioned to talk about this because they have a medical school and an AI school. And they carried out research to ask the question, uh, can AI replace a radiographer? 
reading, like say, uh, screening for cancer uh, tumors or so on. And what they found was that um, in some cases, AI did better. In other cases, the doctor medic uh, did, did better. And of course, AI doesn't have to sleep, so it can keep going and it can keep uh, generating these. But the conclusion they drew was, AI can't replace a radiologist. But a radiologist using AI will replace a radiologist not using AI. And I think that's a really impactful yeah. takeaway from it that we can all take into our professional lives. We have to ask ourselves, how are we using AI every day as that uh, teammate? Okay, brilliant. I've got a question for you, Keith. A, so this one is, um, as AI generates more and more content, it starts to affect its own training base and reinforcing itself. Should we make a nice little copy of the internet now to secure <laughs> a non-AI influenced data foundation? Or do you see alternative strategies that are capable of keeping up with AI speed of creating content? Good question. It's a great question, it's really great. I, I'm not sure we should uh, create a copy of the, uh, of the internet or a snapshot of where we are um, uh, right now, but we absolutely have to be careful about that because if something is trained on a closed loop system and it trains on its own output, where can it lead? It won't lead to a richness of information. Uh, it is like that will become a closed uh, loop. So we have to, and we're seeing already with large language models, we have to look at the, the sources of that training data and ensure that it's, it's rich, uh, broad, unbiased, um, and it can be generated. I mean, we, uh, it's, it's very common technique in, in AI to use data augmentation. So you take a certain data set and then you modify it in some ways to broaden and enrich that, that set. But I think if it's only synthetic, it's problematic. So I think that's a really, it's a great question um, and it's something that you know, we have to be careful with. We also have to be careful about how we interpret the um, output from generative AI. Like, uh, you know, there, it, it can open itself to a healthy degree of plagiarism. Let's say that uh, you're, you know, turning in a university task or something like that, and I use generative AI to generate the answer. Can we detect how much was generated, how much actually came from a student, or, uh, you know, um, how, how would that be possible to do? And you can do that by pattern matching and looking at different styles. There's emerging tools in that area. So I think some of those techniques will be possible to make sure that we have rich data to train on as we go ahead. But oh, what a great question. That was a great question. So we've got 20 seconds, but I'm going to go to Yvonne. With generative AI, how can you as an organization stay authentic? Um, it depends on where you use it for. So for example, uh, if, you, if you are a team who is just saying we have good people, we wear the same jersey and now we are successful, that's not what we believe in. So what we believe in is it's the way of, yeah, it's crucial to have the good people, but the way of working makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And so it helps us to create more uh, knowledge and still we make the decision. So I think it will even make it more clear our identity. Brilliant, okay, so I'm just going to hand back uh, to you, Keith, for your final. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for um, you know, uh, attending the session and uh, I'm hoping that you leave uh, the session with an understanding of generative AI, its opportunities and, and risks. Um, I, I, most importantly, that the AI responsible framework is, is there for you to refer to or use or adopt in, in whatever way you would, uh, you would like. Clearly, it's a huge opportunity. Um, it's one that we have to embrace cautiously, though. Uh, you can't just di dive in with this. You must be informed about all of the risks and be able to mitigate those in, in your organization. Um, the last thing for me to say is um, you know, the, to thank uh, both of the panelists. You both have a huge new fan in terms of governance and how we deploy this. And I'm looking forward to coming back and following up with how we deploy uh, AI. And a new uh, cycling team fan also in, in me, so I'll see you on the road. And uh, 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 thanks to you both for, uh, for a great session. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Hey there, everyone. I want to welcome you all back to the TV studio here in Amsterdam at Cisco Live 2024. We are coming to you live from the hub here in the beautiful Rye Convention Center. I hope you enjoyed our innovation talk on generative AI, and I love what that's called, a cautious embrace. So for Keith, Kim, Yvonne, nicely done. A new wave of AI has, in fact, emerged. Generative AI is the talk of the show. It's being fueled by these LLMs, and it's really captured the imagination of technologists all over the world. But at the same time, we know this, it has impacted the public view on AI, and I'm hoping really that's for the better. There is a lot of fear around AI for good reason, but the opportunities we are seeing within Gen AI, they really are huge. The session that we just watched focused on both of them, the good and the bad. 
because we need to know how to navigate a path toward the most effective use of AI in our environment. So congratulations to our three hosts. Fantastic session, we do appreciate it. Keep reaching out to us throughout the day here on social media using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. I am Steve Moulter, one of your four hosts, and we're going to go out to another one of your four hosts right now. Cedric DeValder, where are you? Well, Steve, you're talking AI. If I think about AI, I think about WebEx. So I'm here at the showcase at, like, in the collaboration booth, and basically we're just going to explore something really cool. This is really amazing technology. It's basically, it's a helmet here, but it has multiple use cases. And it's basically, it has a camera in here and a computer. Um, as always, I'm no expert, but I have an expert with me. So I'm going to go to Jose, who works um, with our WebEx expert on the Mant. So how is it going, Jose? I'm fine. Thank you, Cedric. I'm good. So, Thank you. Um, you are now my, my front-end worker, right? So yes. I think you, you mentioned that you have a, a problem. Yeah, that's so, correct. I'm so, just trying to find out the cabling, and I ha I'll have your I'll need your uh, specialist help on this one. Perfect. So you you joined with the uh, WebEx Expert on Demand uh, into our meeting. So you see we see here on the on the right side on the, on the monitor your uh, what you are seeing in in your monitor from the real glasses, and on the left side this is the WebEx application uh, where we see what what you are transmitting with the video camera. So you see on the on, on your monitor some uh, commands. Please make a photo. So take photo. Take photo. Again. Take photo. So and then you can uh, make an annotation. Annotate. And this one you can uh, say um, share. Share. Okay, now you see that this picture is now sending to my to our WebEx space, and here I pick it up from my from my tablet, and you see here that I see everything, and it's a high definition uh, picture, so I can uh, zoom in. So this is Bata, and here is all camera team which you, which you uh, annotate. And yeah, I so that's that's it. So there was also some some options that I can make uh, maybe an annotation on uh, uh, on your screen. This is also possible. Maybe if you say exit. Sorry. If you say exit. Exit. But with that, I think we're gonna exit this segment. Uh, so we're gonna go back to Steve right now, back to the studio. That may be the best transition I have heard all week, Cedric. Bravo. Well done. Thanks to Jose as well for uh, showing us that great capability. One of the amazing things about being in person here at the show, which I encourage all of you to do, if you've not made it to a Cisco Live yet, please do, wherever you happen to be in the world. But one of the great benefits is the human-to-human -human interaction, the personal engagement. As a really good example, our own Nish Parker had an opportunity to sit down with president of Cisco EMEA, Oliver Tuzik, for a great conversation. Let's Let's watch that right now. Hey everyone, we're here at Cisco Live 2024 Amsterdam. I'm super excited to be here in the studio because I'm joined by Oliver Tusek, who is our EMEA president. Oliver, how are you doing today? Uh, it's amazing. I'm loving what is happening and great to be here with you again. Great, thank you. Now you started out the week amazingly with a great keynote. You're here back in the region and this is your first time hosting this event as our EMEA president. What does it feel like to be here this year as the host of Cisco Live EMEA? It's just great. It's just simply great. It, it, it's so good to be back in the own region. And then this flagship event full of customers, partners, I, I just love it. Me too, me too. When we're here at the studio, we get to walk around, we get to meet everybody, have amazing guests like you here, behind the scenes full of our customers and our partners at home. Um, so what have you enjoyed most about Cisco Live EMEA so far? Oh, that would take half an hour. So um, <laughs> it starts with the energy. Um, yes. There's so much positive momentum, so much energy. And um, talking to the people, I love to talk to the tech guys. Um, there's so many super committed people within customers, partners, and in Cisco that are driving this because this is about technology, it's about innovation. And when you see how we bring together the entire portfolio and how customers tell us, my, my number favorite one comment from a customer, yes. he said, I'm addicted to Cisco yes, technology. Yes, we love to hear that. Yeah, that we was great, that? that. For sure, there are so many tech enthusiasts here. We can see that at the show through the guests, the customers, the partners that we have here. Um, and so for those that might have missed the keynote at the start, 
I know it's available online. I'm not going to put you on the spot to recite it again. <laughs> we don't have as quite, you know, you don't have 13,000 people in the room, but could you give a quick summary? What did you talk about and what is really top of mind for our customers here? What are you hearing and what are you discussing with customers? Okay, well, what I was talking about is mainly about how technology changing our life. Right. And that um, as we are in the technology tech industry, we are the one that can make this world a better place. That sounds big, but just look at what is happening in the world. Uh, there's nothing happening without technology. And we on the Cisco side, we have the best portfolio ever. That was my key message. And then I added something about being more optimistic, being more positive, because right, right now, I think, especially this region, there's certain groups that tend to say, oh, we're behind, right. we're not fast enough, look at where we stand. And I just say, ignore what happened in the past, and let's look forward. And that's why I'm so happy also to be back again, because the opportunity is huge and we get everything we need. Amazing, and obviously we have the rest of the week to come. We're just on day two of the broadcast here at Cisco Live. What are you most excited for what's to come in the future? There's tons of things coming up this week and uh, it's difficult to prioritize anything. Of course, it's the upcoming main stage speech. It's not a speech, it's a Q&A with the guy who brought Siri to Apple. Oh, that, oh. I'm really excited that for that one, be. Oliver. And it's, it's moving the AI discussion on a different level. So that's what I'm personally looking for because I had the time to, to talk with this guy and he's amazing. And I bet you're going to do an incredible job. Oh, my part <laughs> is smaller this time. The, the, the other good thing is there's so many sessions, so many breakouts, and uh, it's not only the sessions, it's kind of the interaction that we see between customers, partners, and our teams. And I, what I heard what is a famous one for most of our tech experts is the whisper suites. Right. Where we share in a very small room what's coming next, what's coming over the next two years, and they love it. So that's another reason to come to Cisco Live in person, right? Be a part of the whisper suites. Correct. Now, you mentioned a word that we've been talking about a lot this week is AI. We've been talking about how to make it secure, how to make it scalable, how to make it ethical. Um, but let's talk about sustainability as well. I know that's also one of the big customer priorities that we're hearing from customers. What does sustainability mean and how does that kind of connect in with AI? So, oh yeah, that's a good one. Um, so, first of all, sustainability has become standard. It's part of every deal we're talking about, it's part of every customer discussion. But to be very honest, it becomes really crisp and turns to real activities as soon as we move to energy cost. As soon as we start to think about how can we fund the investments in all of this one. And, and that gets me also the link to AI. Because to be very clear, if AI is becoming real, and it looks like it will happen pretty soon, the energy problem will be even bigger. Because right. the energy capacity we need with AI, with these big farms that we're building, will be huge. So we need to double down, we need to triple the speed on sustainability to be ready to build the future of AI. Have you seen over in the sustainability zone, there's a build a bike, so you can actually get hands on as well and actually be part, I know sustainability is a massive part of this event. But that's, uh, I, I've been there, I talked to the yes. guys, because when I was a young man, I was collecting trash bikes all around the street to build up my own bikes and sell them. Wow. So I, I, when I saw them there, I was kind of, oh, let's let's. You want to be the tutor, you want to show yeah. all the attendees no, how to build it, right? It's good for the sustainability, but it gives also young people the chance to build something with their own hands. Yes. We're living in this virtual world and we love it, but to be honest, people still need to do something that they can see, that they can touch. And I think it's an amazing project they're doing. Awesome, Oliver, I wish we had more time, so I'm just gonna ask you a couple more questions and then we'll let you get on back to Cisco Live and enjoy everything that's on offer. Wonderful. Now, in your previous role, you were the partner leader. So how are you going to bring that focus in service of our customers here in the region in EMEA? So the, the, the partners are part of our DNA, part of my DNA. And it's pretty clear that we will only be successful together with our partners. So nothing will change on my side. And as I was sitting with uh, Rodney uh, on a, a panel, I made it very clear, my role shifts a bit I'm no longer the guy who's driving the strategy, building the programs and investing into new things. I'm the guy who's executing. So awesome. partners will see me being even closer in the daily business with them. Nothing I love will change. That. Right, last question. The theme of this year is let's go. Yeah. What does that mean to you, Oliver? Let's go is perfect because especially in the EMEA, I must admit, we still tend to think about what is happening in the past, what we could have done better. But I think it's the wrong time to look into the past. It's the wrong time to rest and wait. Maybe the AI wave will not happen or sustainable will sort out on its own. No, that's wrong. It's all about 
action. It's about going, moving on. Standing still is the wrong thing. That's not an option for any of our customers, partners, and certainly not for Cisco with all the You're innovation right. we have, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Oliver, thank you so much for joining me here in the studio. Enjoy the rest of the week, and we'll see you very soon. Oliver is such a lovely guy on top of being such a fantastic leader. It's great to see him here and great to see him in command of this fantastic event. Uh, he's really inspirational for all of us. Now, by the way, we've got our camera up here in the sky, which I believe right now is focused across the hub over into the Cisco store. I'll give a shout out to Brian Domine and Kaylee Bisconti, who do such a fantastic job with the Cisco store on every single event. And by the way, gave me the uh, fabulous gilet slash vest slash puffy vest, whatever you want to call it, uh, that I'm wearing right now, the logo Cisco vest. Not only uh, clothing, books, and so on in that Cisco store, but it is actually a tech center. It's a place where you can see a lot of the new IT protocols, a lot of the great AI innovations that are going into retail environments everywhere. Cisco was just at National Retail Federation last month. We had a fantastic time. Kaylee spoke at that event about a lot of the innovations that they're bringing into the Cisco store, so bravo to them. Make sure that you check it out when you're here at Cisco Live. What do you want this show to be for you? There are really three big things that we focus on. Number one, community, where we meet with Cisco engineers and executives, discuss your unique technical issues, your challenges in business, network and learn with other participants in the technical sessions, connect with friends and social media. Is it education? All of our sessions, our hands-on training, our one-to-one -one meetings, or inspiration, where you hear from Cisco executives and leadership and industry leaders about their vision for the future, all benefits for you, everything you'll find at a Cisco Live. All right, so right now we are going to talk a little IP fabric. Uh, earlier this week, uh, Darren Fulwell from IP fabric and Campbell Gregory from CRG Technology hosted an innovation talk called Knowing What Matters When It Comes to Network Assurance. Customers are benefiting from a different approach to gaining insights into the behavior of their networks. But when you use IP Fabric's data collection and analysis, you're going to get this vendor neutral network data model that can prove the behavior of your network, identify anomalies, it can help guide you toward remediation, and it can remove the need for traditional manual documentation. Hope you enjoyed the innovation talk, away we go. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, we're just going to sort of really chat through um, how CRG have, have helped um, Abba and his team at, at uh, Charles Rossi Speechley using network assurance. Now, IP Fabric's definition, I suppose, of, of network assurance is all about um, really, I suppose, understanding what matters um, in the network. You know, we traditionally, as network engineers, been busy looking at our tooling, um, our monitoring platforms and the like, but which are great for this, but they only give us a certain amount of information. Um, so we go to documentation, right? We have Visio diagrams and our, um, spreadsheets and, our, and our, our document uh, uh, design documents and the like. But again, very manual, it's out of date as soon as we make a change to them. So we end up typically going on the devices themselves. And here's our, our network automation journey for those of you who started down that path. We don't want to use the command line anymore. We don't want to manually have to go and, and check on data and information because ultimately what that ends up with is some poor person having to sit and make sense of it all. Um, we've all done it. We've all sat in, and puzzled for hours over that, uh, that data, over those, that documentation to try and make sense of, of what's in the network. It's the old way of doing things, right? We, we end up having tooling that, that means that we're, we're looking at the network device by device, looking at every single configuration, every single piece of state. We're having to worry about vendor-specific tooling and, and often technology focus. So being Cisco customers, I'm sure that, that you guys are, are, are looking at your, your data center infrastructure using APIC for ACI, or you're looking at your SD-WAN with vManage, but you don't have a, a, a way of, of looking at it as a whole. Unless, of course, you're using do-it-yourself do tooling, open source tooling, building your own automation platforms. But IP Fabric, we believe that that's, that's 
fine to a point, but in reality, you don't want to be doing this yourself. You don't want to be building your own solutions. You want to be able to, to find a different way, and that's to use network assurance. This is all about getting rid of those archaic methods that can only tell us part of the story. And this is what CRG have, have implemented for Charles Russell Speechley. So this is why we wanted really to, to introduce these guys today, because they can tell the story probably as well as, if not better, than we can. Now, if you do want to find out a little bit more about how IP Fabric does its thing, we do have a breakout session tomorrow. Uh, you're welcome to join us. I think there are still spaces. So please do uh, look in your, in your uh, schedule. But I wanted to introduce first um, uh, Abba, who's, who sat with me here. He, he works, obviously, for Charles Russell Speechley, and it can, it can give you a bit more understanding, I suppose, of really the challenges, I suppose, uh, Abba, that you faced when you engaged um, CRG. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, <clears throat> I think we've got limited time. I, I could talk, talk tomorrow <laughs> with all the challenges that we've all got uh, across our organizations. <clears throat> but essentially, um, there are three areas where <clears throat> sorry. Um, there are three areas across our organization, IC as a department, where challenges like compliance um, as, as a legal firm in the, in the legal market, um, obviously cybersecurity is a big one. Keeping your code up to date <clears throat> is a yeah, sorry, my voice got so good. I can <clears throat> Cough. Um, keeping your code up to date is, is, is obviously um, hard to maintain. We've been working with legacy providers over the years where uh, we offload some of our network maintenance to external teams because our team is small. Our tech is obviously big and I'm sure many of you have got complicated environments yourselves. And one of the key challenges is maintaining it all. Giving context around some of the alerting that we have. We, we all have monitoring tools. We all have network engineers that could monitor our networks and our equipment. But then how do you put context around what we're seeing on the network? And again, going into uh, the world of data, going into the world of AI, going into providing the tools and services, the digital workspace for our users around some of the tools they use, we need to provide a stable network. That stable network doesn't come easily. Um, it's hard to maintain. It's becoming more complicated, even though to the end user, what they see is a laptop with lots of software that they utilize every day. But behind the scenes, there's a lot of maintenance and lots of uh, infrastructure that goes into it. So how do we get around that? Well, apart from building uh, a really big, large team that can maintain it all, we need to uh, implement something, a service which CRG first approached us with was around providing a, a tool set, a tool capability where rather than have multiple engineers that could be monitoring your network, understanding the alerting, understanding the performance and doing something about it, but actually having a dynamic tool that can actually uh, envisage what, what the kind of problems that you're going to face and actually look at the, your network as a whole from an assurance perspective, is your code up to date? Are there any performance issues identifying those? Um, and of course, and I'm sure there's a few engineers in the audience today, um, I've struggled over the years to find engineers that like documentation. I'm sure many of you <laughs> have, have struggled yourselves. But essentially, documentation, when it comes to large, complicated networks, is very hard to upkeep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we have never found a tool like this, a service like this provided by CRG, where the documentation capability is so dynamic. At any point, at any time, we can create a network topology of our current network with all our interlinks, with all of our connections, uh, going across our Cisco estate, but into our other vendor estate, and, and we can work out exactly what's going on. So the, the main key challenge there for us was visibility, yeah. making sure that we're getting best use out of the engineers that we do have, and of course, compliance is a, is, is, is a big piece to that. No, that's, uh, that's great stuff. I suppose, Campbell, once you, uh, once you were engaged to, to move things along, um, how did you approach it and what, what, what did you look for in terms of service improvements that you could bring? So I think, I mean, as a, a smaller business compared to the larger providers and with CRS having a number of 24 by 7 managed service providers and things like that, 
we had to try and find a way to differentiate ourselves. Uh, and I think that's where we're leading with uh, IP Fabric as a tool set and how we are leading with tools has enabled us to show value quite quickly. Because as a smaller partner, you kind of get ruled out immediately as soon as you show up. You know, they've got three CCIEs you know, at the much bigger providers. But you know, the, the traditional way in which network audits and discovery and providing that level of assurance was done was extremely expensive. By the time the audit was done and the documentation was created and you've presented it to senior management, it's all changed. Yeah. So I think one of the key aspects of leading with IP Fabric is it gave us a way to differentiate, it gave us a way to show value immediately, and also from a third party point of view, we're not marking our own homework, so those assurance checks immediately give us something to talk about, and they're all based off common SSH commands. It's all things we all know and understand. So I think that enabled us to quite quickly report back into CRS's senior management to say these are all the things that we have discovered in terms of your network, which is on a 24 by 7 managed service, which is you know, in the hands of service providers, but the service providers don't necessarily always have your best interests at heart. So I think that's quite quickly we've been able to mark other homework uh, and show value immediately. And those uh, intent checks and things like that to to create a report in less than a day, yeah. I haven't seen many other tools, you know, that have been can be deployed so quickly. I, I suppose for for me as a as an ex uh, network consultant myself, <laughs> I've spent many a happy hour, as I'm sure many of the people here have, with pen and paper, um, drawing maps of of networks and and trying to transfer that into uh, into into documentation. For, for me, documentation is dead, right? It's a complete waste of time for, for the reasons you pointed out. And I think that's one of the things that, that I like to think of, of with IP Fabric is that it's a, a different approach, right? You've, yeah. You're building a, a, a database of the network, and it just so happens that one of the outputs from that database is documentation that you yeah. can trust. But in reality, you don't treat it as documentation, right? It's, yeah. it's much more than that. Yeah, and I think it, they are genuinely technical challenges, because I think a lot of the time, you know, you're getting approached with product uh, and the products are there to solve your solutions. Like we can even talk about Thousand Eyes and yeah. things like that where, again, you have to deploy Thousand Eyes to see the value. You've got to do all those things. So uh, leading with a tool set that we can provide the documentation extremely quickly, vendor agnostic, highlighting the key, you know, Cisco infrastructure that they had, we were able to, you know, report back on things like spanning tree issues, um, the real the devil's in the detail, and I think the diagramming and documentation was one thing, but to come back and, and say to ABBA and to say to the senior management, we can fix your spanning tree, we can fix all the things that do actually keep you up at night that are causing issues, it was again a slightly different approach to buy a new network and all your problems will go away, because yeah. we also know in the migration, they're just gonna take the old configuration and throw it on the new kit, because people aren't really interested in fixing your problems. So you propagate the old problems to the new. Exactly. Because you, yeah. you've not got that grasp, yeah. I, I, I suppose the other thing I was thinking that, that as well as using the product interactively, you know, this network assurance is a bigger topic. It's not just about having a tool you can do stuff with, but it's about providing data and, and validation to people who are interested in that, with, you know, with a bigger picture in yeah. mind, I suppose. So. How have you, have you approached that to look at reporting and that kind of thing? So I think one of the best features within the IP Fabric platform is the open API, is the Python SDK. Um, the standard reporting that you get out of the platform goes into a Word document. It, it's quite vanilla, but when you actually start working with the API and you start seeing the capabilities of that platform, you can create very custom reports, uh, and that could be for security and compliance reasons. It could be for various network uh, assurance tasks, but it's a, it's a database that the more you use it, the more you query it, the more information it's going to give you. And there's only so much information, you know, IP Fabric can put on a, on a GUI, on a dashboard, but the key is the information that sits in that database, and we're able to uh, call it and get the right information and present to the right people as well. So, you know, to ABBA's, um, to senior management, they might not be as interested in some of the lower level details, but in terms of audit and compliance and reporting, you know, and some of the bigger tasks, you know, a lot of organizations are trying to go through things like ISO, SOC 2, yeah. things like that. Having the tool that provides your reports, you know, every day, you know, however you set your snapshots up is a great advantage. So 
we, we've been able to capitalize on that and not only lead with technical problems, but audit and compliance is the top of most people's agenda. So sure. you're coming in with a different approach. And I think that's where it's a tool that provides us as a consultancy to give a lot more value quickly. Yeah. And Abba, have you found that, that now you have the data, yeah. you're able to, to not just fix the problems faster, but also report on it better. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I guess f from my perspective, you know, I don't dwell into the system myself. I'm not that technical anymore, unfortunately. But uh, essentially, even from a, just a central management perspective, just understanding the condition of our network itself, seeing a, an overview uh, report on the status of our network is very beneficial for me. But in, increasingly for the, for the network teams that are involved in the security teams, we can potentially iron out where there, there are potential issues. So it's, it's, it's hugely important. Um, and, you know, over the years we've seen advancements in WAN technology, SD-WAN, and there's been a level of automation, but it sounds simple. Yeah. Uh, the service sounds simple, but it's very, very effective. And I'm surprised that we haven't, we haven't been there before. It's, it's interesting because obviously we have all of those different technologies and we have all of those different automation platforms for all of those different areas of the network, but it's all about bringing that together, I suppose, and, and having that, that overall understanding yeah. of what's in the network. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we've had monitoring solutions over the years, you know, data center monitoring solutions, network monitoring solutions, but they, they don't give you context behind the actual, yeah. if there is a potential issue, what is the actual problem? Um, and understanding that using that data, and because it's so data rich, you can automate tasks on the back of that. So again, it's modernizing what a internal network looks like and modernizing how we fix problems going forward. S sounds simple, but <laughs> something that we've never had before. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Go on, Cam. Yeah, I was just going to say, building on that, I think a lot of people, or we've found everyone has a big appetite for automation, but people don't realize how hard it is to achieve automation until you've standardized and fixed all the problems you've got. So I think one of the key things you know, for us in, in IP Fabric and providing that level of assurance, it gets us you know, as an organization to the point where we're also confident to automate because you know, I don't want any of our, our automation engineers going out and you know, destroying customer networks until we have the confidence that the, the client's network is also in a place to be automated. So I think you know, that's where for us and, and for uh, Charles Russell Speechley's, it gives everyone a little bit of confidence to go and say the network is at a, uh, a level of assurance that we are confident to go and start making bigger and better changes. Um, and in getting to that, you've really got to fix the boring, the boring stuff. But it is you know, the, the little things that are going to trip you up as you start that automation journey. So, and again, sometimes people don't find that to be the most big transformation transformation projects, but they're the things that are going to stop your transformation right, project. Right. Um, so yeah, we've just found that to be extremely helpful. Yeah, and I guess that's, that's the, where the growth for the future comes from, right? There's, you've got you've to start with a foundation and you've got to build from there. So I, I guess that's something that, uh, that you're both thinking about for the future of, of Charles Russell Speechless Network, I guess, right, Abba? Correct. I mean, since oh, obviously COVID sounds like a distant <laughs> history now, but um, since COVID, the way we work, where we work, uh, that's changed. Our network designs have changed. We've moved internet security to the edge. Um, and so, you know, maintaining those networks, complicated networks, um, even though the user still has that same experience, they can work from anywhere, they have the device that they can work from, behind the scenes, it's a complicated area yeah. of networks that you need to maintain. Uh, and for us, uh, you know, there's lots of use cases where this is added value. Uh, we as an organization have restructured our internal office networks uh, and we're, we're going towards a, um, uh, a Wi-Fi only connected right. office. And again, so making sure that we have that visibility of the condition of our network is hugely important. And that's quite stuff. And Campbell, any, any other thoughts on, on, on where you go from here? <laughs> It largely depends on Abba's appetite <laughs> from there. But no, I think in terms of the, the roadmap at the moment is, is the focus is on the assurance piece. I think that's going to set the base to start the orchestration piece later on. So I think in the short term, we've got you know, the automation appetite and the orchestration side of things is coming into play. Um, but you know, 12 months from now, 
uh, the organization will be in a much better place to start bigger uh, orchestration activities. Uh, and I think also uh, one of the big things around automation and, and things like that is it's not only for the big, big enterprises. Um, the medium, mid-size uh, organizations really struggle with it. They don't know where to get started. Sure. So I think that's part of, big part of the partnership is you know, leaving customers better off. We, we don't look to outsource managed services or anything like that. If anything, we want to bring the tool sets back in-house so you can take control of your network again using automation. So we've seen some of the challenges where you've outsourced your SD-WAN or you've gone down the SASE route and what used to be a quick firewall rule change is now weeks if not months <laughs> of product team discussions and that's not available and it's really frustrating. But I think if we can leave Charles Russell Speechley's in a place where they've got the tool sets to take on that responsibility back you know, hopefully that is certainly our vision to give customers the tools to, to give their team the tools to take more yeah, responsibility yeah. back on. And do you find um, that's a differentiator for you as a, as a small, uh, small consultancy? Is that fair? I think so. I think for us, you know, it's, we don't have the facilities to outsource things, being frank. But I think it's also we like to empower teams internally. And I think that's one of the greatest things around automation and orchestration. Once you get your house in order, you can bring that capability back in-house. Uh, and yeah, we're a big, uh, we would encourage that because I think we see some of the frustrations when you outsource those services. It yeah. is extremely frustrating. Uh, and at the rate in which networks are changing and things like that, if you can bring the tool sets back in-house, uh, we'd certainly do that. And I also <laughs> enjoy sleeping at night. So 24 <laughs> by seven managed service on these networks, we could try and split the, the roles and responsibilities up, yeah. but certainly we want to leave customers better off and leave them with the tools yeah. and the skill set and the know-how. I've got one other question for you, for you Abba, uh, about cloud. Um, I don't know how, what, what your, your, your cloud uptake looks like and, and, and where you're going with that. Are, yeah. is, is that a big part of your environment now? It, it is, but traditionally, being a, a law firm, lots of our clients that we deal with, lots of uh, private capital clients, they typically didn't like their data in the cloud. Sure. But of course, you have those conversations with them. Like, okay, where does your email sit? Oh, it's in Office 365. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so gradually, uh, there's more maturity around our clients and their appetite of uh, moving stuff in the cloud. We, as a, uh, as a law firm, have struggled with legal vendors yeah. that haven't really taken up what the public vendors have done with cloud. So it's been a, an arms race to see which legal vendors uh, replicate their their services in the cloud. So, but ultimately, rather than infrastructure in the cloud, we've looked at the best of breed SaaS services sure, in the cloud. Sure. So, obviously, like many organisations, um, you know, assurance around some of the cloud platforms that we use is hugely important, um, and the appetite for our users to have downtime is. Is you know it's the more yeah. uptime you give them, yeah, yeah. the yeah, it's time never for downtime enough, right? is, uh, yeah, yeah. becomes more crucial. So. And I guess I guess having the uh, having a, a, a good understanding of the cloud environment as a network, because ultimately this is someone else's network, right? But but uh, that's got to help having it as as all part of one one visibility platform, I suppose. And that's the problem, you know. So many technology vendors out there. There's there's lots of dashboards. Uh, there's lots of complications, but having one central uh, system where you can monitor exactly what's going on across your network, cloud to on-premise, yeah. to your SaaS services is, is highly beneficial. And I can see us in the next couple of years really um, broadcasting our capability around how we monitor everything across our cloud and on-premise environments. Awesome. Thank you. Any other, any, any other thoughts while I dwell on the, on the cloud side of things there, Campbell? No, I think, I mean, the only thing that we typically see is that cloud kind of raced ahead in terms of the DevOps functions, the infrastructure as code and things like that. And that what we're trying to do, and especially with IP Fabric, bring all of that back into the same team. So, you know, even within uh, CRS, there's Ansible modules running, doing all sorts of different things. But that appetite isn't necessarily on, on the networking yeah. team. So trying to spread that across multiple teams, have the same appetite for... Uh, for more automation, for more infrastructure as code, spreading the tool sets, making things more consumable. So I think we've seen cloud, that's quite normal nowadays, you know, to spin things up very quickly in cloud, but then the same appetite isn't there when you're deploying a site from yeah. a networking perspective. So I think that's where we see the two worlds coming together quite nicely. Being able to and treat them as one. Exactly, and they you know, not should be one, because some big businesses 
have carved them out for a reason. But I think in, in smaller, mid-sized clients, it is one team necessarily. And I think bringing that visibility and capability into one platform does make life a lot easier. Because I think when you start troubleshooting cloud networking, it's a long day <laughs> for some people. Long day for someone. Yeah. Anyway, but, uh, yeah. Well, I've just got a couple of takeaways I want to go through. We, if, if you see anything in, on the list here, just shout and, uh, and we'll see, see if, uh, uh, if we can shed some light on it. So, so the things I'm hearing is, is obviously we want to be able to manage complexity. That's, that's the key here. You've got um, lots of different technologies, lots of different parts of the network, lots of different uh, levels of existing support and, and different tooling and whatever that you're using to, to, to do that. So it's all about bringing, bringing it together and being able to manage it as one. Well. I think that's super important. Like I say, just shout if you disagree. Um, th the second thing here is, is the fact that we're dealing with, with knowledge about the network and not just data. It's great having the data points about individual devices and individual interfaces, and, and, but, but you've got to have the context. I think you, you mentioned the, having the context there. So I think that's, that's obviously super, super important. And then, of course, that, that all has to be consumable by whoever needs it. So that might be the network engineer who needs that, that instant representation of the, of the data as the documentation, because that's what makes sense to them. But it might also be um, your higher ups who want the, the, you know, the reporting on your compliance or whatever. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, guys. That, uh, that, was, that was great. I just wanted to, to run through those points. Um, if anyone's interested in learning out uh, any more, um, there's a couple of QR codes there to, uh, to point you to some, some websites. Um, IP Fabric are at uh, booth C12, right in the middle of the world of solutions. You can't really miss us. So uh, yeah, if you uh, want to, to pop over and, and have a chat with any of us, feel free. Um, otherwise, um, unless there are any questions, um, that's us. But, uh, I don't think there are any questions. Oh, we have a question from the gentleman in the corner. Ah. Do you think all network documentation is dead? All, really? Uh, what a great question. <laughs> um, I, I guess network documentation for the sake of operations, I would say, is dead because the point here is that you're replacing the need for it with a, with a tool that can give you that, that, same, that same visualization, um, but actually a more, potentially more meaningful visualization. So I think that's, that's important. Um, Go on. I think you're not doing it justice with the answer, but Go on. <laughs> from, a net, from an end customer's perspective, what we've noticed regarding the platform that you guys have implemented for us is there's a, there's a snapshot. So depending on how far you set up the system to, to take logs of all of your network infrastructure, there's a snapshot of point in time where you can go back and see how was your network configured six months ago. So why that is beneficial? One, uh, from a historical point of view is if, if you had an incident, for example, touch wood, none of you do, but you can essentially go back and see what version of code you had on, on, your, on your network devices, what open ports you had. So from that perspective, historical perspective is mm. good, but also while we talk about complicated nature of multiple vendors, documentation, being able to, within 20, 30 seconds, create a full network diagram of your entire infrastructure to, to give to a new vendor that you want to integrate that essentially is very, very beneficial. Or, or to onboard yeah. new staff, I guess. But Yeah, I think it's, it's, I don't think traditional, it's the approach to documentation, I think, is data. Because sometimes we see it where we get a request to export one of the diagrams, and the key question is, what are you going to do with that? And they go, it's going straight back into Visio, and I'm going straight back into my traditional way of looking at documentation. And you've just undone all the hard work of putting in a far more dynamic solution. And I think it, it's changing that approach to what, what is documentation. Uh, and some documentation is better than none. And there's, there's nothing worse than walking into a customer environment and you go, right, give us an overview, show us your documentation. And they go, what documentation? We hate documentation. And you go, well, we love it because we're trying to f solve your problems. Yeah. So let's meet you halfway. And why don't we put a tool in here that will take some of the burden away but I think that, that approach to, I, if anyone does like documentation, please put your <laughs> hand up and I can put you in touch with Millen who loves documentation. <laughs> but I think for us it is that approach in, in trying not to have those static documents, trying to have point in time references, the ease to go to the snapshot and see what, what actually happened um, in great detail. 
And then you can always build on it. And I think I mentioned that very briefly with the open API. You can do a lot in terms of your own documentation. So what IP Fabric might produce might not be perfect for your business, but the ability to augment that and do what you want with it, if you understand how to use the API, I think that can complement whatever documentation process you have even. So yeah, I wouldn't say it's dead, but it certainly gives you a fresh approach to yeah. better documentation and a, a much more dynamic approach. I can't ask for a more complete answer than that, I think. <laughs> uh, so thank you for the question. No well, that's, that looks like it. So th thank you very much, everybody, for, for coming to uh, speak to us. And if, uh, if you want to see more, come over to B C 12. Thank you.